half nine we're supposed to start. Good morning and you're very, very welcome, all of you. Uh, I want to say a special welcome, I think, to our visitor from Japan, Kazuo Fuji, where is he? Came a long distance. Yes, you're very welcome, Kazuo. And people from other countries too, but particularly Kazuo, because um, he's uh, very involved with um, SGI in, in Europe. Um, it is one year uh, since we had uh, the first seminar focusing on Dr. Desaku Ikeda's approaches to peace building. This is almost a year back. Today also, as you all know by now, listening to the news, is the 15th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And I was listening to um, BBC on the way down in the taxi, and Blair was speaking about it. Um, Tony Blair, and uh, he said it really is a framework. So I just thought I would quote that actually because it is a framework, but the real um, task of peace building is the implementation of that framework, and that is one of the aspects we're going to perhaps touch on um, today. So. We will be focusing on the philosophy and the practices of Dr. Desaku Ikeda. Uh, and for those of you who may not be fully aware of who he is, he is the leading uh, Buddhist philosopher currently, living in Japan, writing. Um, what attracted me to his ideas and his ideals is that he's not only a brilliant philosopher, and if you want to know more about that, this is the book to read, um, De Sacco Ikeda's Philosophy of Peace, which was actually the result of research done by our keynote speaker, Dr. Olivier Arbain. It is a first-class book. But what, a, what attracts me about De Sacco Ikeda is he's not only a brilliant philosopher, but he is a man of action, and you rarely get that. For example, he has created two universities, one Soka University in Tokyo, which I have visited, another one in California. He has created the Soka school system from kindergarten to secondary all the way up. He uh, submits peace proposals to the United Nations every year, which are taken seriously and discussed, dialogue about them. He has had dialogue with politicians all over the world, was very effective during the time of Glasnost in meetings with uh, Gorbachev, and also in ensuring that there would be uh, more peaceful uh, and productive relationships between China and uh, Japan. So you see what I, what I mean about being a man of action as well as being a brilliant philosopher. And he has formed what's called the SGI, the Soka Gakkai International, which is a network throughout the world of people working for peace. It's astonishing, isn't it? And he's still going strong, writing uh, in his, his house in Tokyo and producing all these ideas and circulating them throughout the world. Um, he, I was inspired by reading that book um, and just to give you a little example of how his work has spread and how the influence of his ideas of peace building are spreading. There are inside universities worldwide research centers focusing on his peace building theories and ideas. 30 in China. Now that surprised me that there is so much of that kind of activity um, and thinking and reflection and cooperative action to bring about peace in China, also in Argentina and in Denmark. And for the last 10 years, annual conferences, international conferences to discuss his ideals. There's also um, regional organizations, or REAP as they call it, regional efforts to achieve peace in Boston, Norway, Oslo, Bangkok, and our keynote speaker, Dr. Olivier Arbain, his Institute um, for Research into Global Peace. I mean, it's astonishing, isn't it? It really is astonishing. I think Desaku Ikeda is unique. 
The SGI that I mentioned, the Soka Gakkai International Network, is now in 192 countries in the world, um, throughout the world, all working for peace. So today we will be focusing, uh, I won't be saying any more actually, I just wanted to give people some um, perception about the kind of person we will be talking about and the work that he has done and the work that he is still doing and the way he has involved people worldwide, people, ordinary people worldwide in, in working together and cooperating to bring about peace. Um, I'll read just a little um, paragraph from this, which is not a summary of his ideas because that's not possible, but it's the, the heading is Transforming the Human Spirit. And he says, a new set of global ethics, creating a global sense of the deep interconnections among people is a first step towards true disarmament and world peace. To create world peace, we need courage and hope. He, he talks about three qualities usually, wisdom, compassion, and courage, all three needed together, hopefully. We need to be educated and we need to educate others. We need to engage in dialogue. We know all about that here in Northern Ireland, don't we? Dialogue, not just debating, not just discussions. We need to be educated, we need to educate others, we need to engage in dialogue with many different peoples, reaching across the barriers that divide us. We need to take peaceful action. So uh, something that really has moved me very much today is that we received a message of support from the Sako Ikeda. I couldn't believe it, but we did. And um, there was a request that we should read it out um, before the um, seminar starts. So I'm asking Robert Samuels, who's the general director of the SGI in the UK. Would you, would you read it out first, Robert? Do you want to come up here? I will, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> so I'll read this as it's written here. Professor Richard Barnett is addressed to you, first of all, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ulster, Professor Pauline Murphy, Emerita Professor Social Inclusion, Professor Brandon Hamber, Director of the International Conflict Research Institute. Dr. Duncan Morrow, Institute for Research in Social Sciences. Sciences. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. As founder of the Toda Institute for Global Peace and Policy Research, and on behalf of the members of Soccer Gakkai International, SGI, in 192 countries and territories around the world, allow me to take this opportunity to share some thoughts on the convening of this seminar, inclusive peace building locally and globally. Today, April the 10th, marks the 15th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. One day prior to the signing on April the 9th, I had the opportunity to meet in Tokyo with the then Deputy President of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki. Reflecting on the intense efforts of the people of South Africa to overcome the legacy of hatred and pain caused by the apartheid system, my heart earnestly yearned for the successful conclusion of the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement in the face of the looming deadline. In our talks, Deputy President Mbeki and I explored the challenge of building societies where an ethos of peaceful coexistence prevails. My heart thus soared when I heard the news the next day that the agreement had been successfully signed on April the 10th even as talks continued past the midnight deadline. I offered prayers for the repose of all those who had fallen victim during the three decades of the Troubles, and I deepened my resolve as a Buddhist to continue to engage in the kind of dialogue and activities that might free the world of needless suffering and misery. To rid the world of misery this was the heartfelt desire of Jose Toda, 1900 to 1958, second president of the Soka Gakkai, and my personal mentor, after whom the Institute for Global Peace and Policy Research is named. <clears throat> Since its founding in February 1996, 
the Institute has upheld Jose Toda's spirit as it has continued to organise conferences and workshops around the world in the quest for the resolution of conflict and the construction of durable peace. It has also promoted various research projects focusing on the global issues that threaten people's lives and dignity, such as poverty and environmental degradation. On December 2nd, 1999, the day autonomous government was realised in Northern Ireland based on the peace agreement, the Toda Institute, together with Queen's College City University of New York, organised the Human Security and Global Governance Northern Ireland Conference with the attendance of Senator George Mitchell and representatives of the different parties in Northern Ireland. In a dialogue that I published with Elise Boulding, the renowned peace scholar noted that her late husband Kenneth Boulding had often compared peace culture to a small island afloat in a vast sea of war culture. But he was also confident that such small islands of peace would inevitably replicate themselves over and over. This is the hope which we must never relinquish or abandon. I hold the most profound respect for the people of Northern Ireland who have chosen the path of building a culture of peace despite the many difficulties to be surmounted, including the psychological barriers caused by years of strife and the trauma of protracted conflict. The people of Northern Ireland have fulfilled the expectations of the Boldings and other people of goodwill. You have shown us, through your example, just how a culture of peace can be realised. I laud the tenacity and perseverance of the people who refused to give up hope and continued to push forward one step at a time toward the goals of reconciliation and peaceful coexistence. Nelson Mandela, the former president of South Africa, voiced his empathy and support, saying, quote, we have long admired the people of Northern Ireland who have endured much and who, like our own people in South Africa, are now working together to build a new society, end quote. Your example is a source of immeasurable hope and encouragement to all who struggle to transcend conflictual divisions and the terrible sufferings of internal strife. Three years ago, Professor Pauline Murphy visited Tokyo Soccer School. As the school's founder, I was deeply grateful for the incisive vision which she shared with the students. Quote, the 21st century may be the most dangerous century of all. Unless we uphold correct values, human life will be endangered. End quote. As she aptly indicated, now is the time to share this message with the people of the world and shift global trends away from a culture of violence and war toward a new culture of peace. What then are the correct values that we should uphold as people living in the 21st century? Fifteen years ago, the people of Northern Ireland were impelled to choose the path of reconciliation and sign the peace treaty by the heartfelt cry that the cycles of violence, terror and meaningless death must be broken. This yearning arising from the depths of the human heart is the foundation for building solidarity across differences of race, race, ethnicity, religion or culture. It must be underpinned by the universal value of our commitment to the inherent dignity of life. In my annual proposal for peace this year, I shared the story of the demoness Kishimojin in Sanskrit Hariti, as it appears in the Buddhist scriptures. Kishimojin had an enormous number of children and was said to kill other people's children to feed her own. When her youngest and most cherished child was hidden from her, she finally came to recognise the nature of the pain she had inflicted on so many other parents. From that point on, according to the scriptures, she reformed her evil ways 
and resolved to make the protection of all children her mission. What I wish to convey through citing this ancient tale is that when we empathise with the sufferings of others and share the resolve that no one should have to endure that pain, we are empowered to break even the most entrenched cycles of violence and hatred. I'm sure these were the feelings that moved the mothers of Belfast, outraged at the senseless loss of three children's lives in a conflict-related accident in 1976. These mothers rose up in courage and solidarity to start to break the chains of hatred. This is the powerful example set by the people of Northern Ireland. It is indeed meaningful that this seminar about peacebuilding in divided societies is being held here in Belfast on the anniversary of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. I would like to express my heartfelt prayers for the success of your deliberations, for the further flourishing of INCOR and the University of Ulster, and for the continued good health and happiness of everyone attending today. April the 10th, 2013, Daisaku Keda, founder, Toda Institute for Global Peace and Policy Research, and president of Sokogaka International. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm not quite sure what to say because I hadn't really anticipated such a, a detailed and generous message. And so we, we really do appreciate it from the University of Ulster and, and INCOR. Um, so thank you for bringing that and, and, and uh, for Daseko Okeda's words. We, we value them. Uh, my name is Brandon Hamber. I am the, the director of, of INCOR. Um, I have a, a really easy job today. All I have to do is introduce the speakers and then chair uh, the discussion. Um, so I, I hopefully uh, will, will be getting off lightly, but I just wanted to firstly uh, welcome you all here and thank you very much for, for coming. Um, this is the second seminar we've had focusing uh, particularly on the Seiko Okada's uh, philosophy of peace. Uh, as Pauline said, we had one last year. Um, and we have a little bit more time this year um, and also have uh, probably the foremost expert on the philosophy and theory uh, behind his work here, Olivier Bain, and so it's a great pleasure for us to, to have him here. Um, I think by way of welcome, uh, certainly the message we received uh, highlights the importance of uh, our interconnectedness in the world, um, and I couldn't help thinking when I heard the word island of peace that we're a sort of little island of peace here, but, uh, you know, it's being recorded, these things will be connected in different ways, and the message connects us to, to, to different people as well, and I think that that's uh, a key <coughs> a key issue um, and I think also reminds us here that uh, often when we get so tied up on what's working and what's not working in the Northern Ireland context that actually there's a bigger picture out there and, and the world is watching it and uh, learning from it and extracting lessons and, and I think that that's a very important uh, lesson for us to to take away and, and the message certainly highlighted that for me uh, having said that, I think there's a lot that has been done and there's a lot that's been achieved, but I'm sure today we will also look at uh, some of what still needs to be, uh, needs to be achieved. Um, so I'm going to uh, begin uh, by firstly thanking Pauline uh, at the start uh, for pulling together this, uh, this seminar. Um, she's been working very hard to make sure this has all happened, and so it's great that it is happening. So I just wanted to thank her um, for convening the seminar. Um, and then I wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Olivier Rabain. Um, he's going to speak for about 40, 40, 45 minutes. Um, and then we'll hear from Duncan uh, Morrow in response uh, to that. But I'll introduce Duncan uh, after Olivier has spoken. Um, it's been a real privilege for us. Uh, Olivier has uh, come here and is, he's going to be with us for this whole week. Uh, so we've had some time uh, talking on different subjects and it's been very enlightening um, for myself certainly. And yesterday he spoke with some of our students and, and that was uh, great. Um, Olivier uh, was appointed the director of the Toda Institute for Global Peace and uh, Policy Research in April 2008. He was formerly a professor of modern languages and peace studies at Soka University in Japan and director of Transcend the Arts and Peace Network. Uh, the artistic branch of Johann Galtung's 
uh, Transcend uh, Peace and Development Initiative. Uh, he was also the co-convener of the Commission <laughs> of Art and Peace uh, of the International Peace Research Association and a member of the IPRA Council in 2008. Um, he has numerous publications. I'm not going to go through uh, all of those. Um, obviously, Pauline has highlighted uh, his seminal work on uh, the Seiko Kato's uh, philosophy. Uh, he's also edited books on the issue uh, of uh, music and conflict transformation, which I understand is your second big uh, passion and, uh, and interest, and numerous other, other articles. So it comes to us with an enormous amount of experience and background, and we're really privileged and, and glad that you have, uh, you've joined us. The overall uh, title of the seminar was um, Peace Building Locally and Globally. But specifically, Olivia is going to talk on eliminating all forms of violence from our lives, the Seiko Akeda's philosophy of peace and community dialogue. And so uh, thank you very much, and we look forward to your speech. Thank you. Good morning. It's uh, really a pleasure meeting you, and thank you so much for being here today, because I understand there's a lot of competition I understand that most of Belfast is listening to uh, Paul Nolan at this time, but uh, we were able to get 50 people in this room, uh, which is kind of a miracle. So each of you is so precious, and thank you so much for choosing this one. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so uh, the whole seminar is about including, uh, inclusive peace building locally and globally. And I want to say from the start, I really believe that those two are exactly the same, the local and the global. There's basically no difference. They're fundamentally one because the most uh, important discussions going on at the United Nations about climate change or in any committees about people. It's people just like you and me trying their best to get agreements and to get things done. That's nothing else, there's no mystery. So when you try to solve problems at the local level, you have to bring out the best in yourself and it's really how you relate to yourself and to others in that situation. And it's exactly the same in those big rooms in New York or anywhere in the world. So the global and the local, I believe, are, are one. It's, it's really about people. Um, so the, the title of my, my particular presentation today is Eliminating All Forms of Violence from Our Lives. That's Aku Ikeda's philosophy of peace and community building. So when I mean all forms of violence, of course you can imagine all kinds of uh, bombs and tools and weapons and nuclear weapons or knives or guns, but it's not only that, it's the, there are three major levels of violence according to Johann Galtung, two that we don't see. But if we don't take care of all three, it's not going to work. The one we see is uh, direct violence, means killing, hurting, maiming, raising your voice when somebody ha is not empowered, all those things are direct violence. And that's what we think about when we talk about violence usually, but underlying this is structural violence. It's, it's very, very important because the way institutions are uh, made, the way contracts are made, who gets what, who has the power, we cannot really see it, but it creates uh, all over the world, if it's not done properly, it creates imbalance, it creates injustice, and according to Johann Galtung, the two key words of structural violence are oppression and exploitation. And you can't really see it, but you know, there's um, thousands of people die of hunger every day. There's enough food in the world, but thousands and thousands of people die of hunger every day. Where does that come from? Who, nobody goes and kills them, but because we have a system that doesn't really work, at least for them, they have to die every day. So that, that is structural violence. And where does that come from, according to Galtung again, who is uh, one of the founders of Peace Studies? It comes from cultural violence. Cultural violence is in each of us. It's a way of thinking when we think, oh, it's okay, you know, I don't really like that group of people. So the fact that the law is in our favor and they can't vote or they can't have um, employment or they can't have housing, it's okay with me. That's cultural violence, that you think another human being is less than you. This type of cultural violence then generates unfair structures, structural violence, and this uh, gives way to people revolting, uh, people being fed up, going in the streets, then you have direct violence. So that's what I meant by all forms of violence. We have to take care of everything, not just the direct violence, get rid of weapons, but also uh, get rid of bad structures, bad governments, and the, the priority, get rid of discrimination within our heart, and that's the hardest part. Um, so, 
Dr. Ikeda started actually as a, as a Buddhist when he was 19 years old, and he's fundamentally a spiritual leader, a Buddhist leader of uh, an organization of um, 12 million people throughout the world. But he's not only a Buddhist. I think he's uh, much more than that. He's a humanist. He's a human being really trying his best, who has in really powerful values and principles to share. Uh, and uh, so sometimes I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to start my sentence by, in Buddhism, when um, the values and principles are easily identifiable with Buddhism. But sometimes I'm going to say, in Dr. Ikeda's philosophy, when I think it's more appropriate. So depending on the situation, I'm going to use different uh, prefixes, if you want, to my sentence. In Buddhism, one of the most important uh, virtues is gratitude. Uh, self-generated gratitude. When you, you wake up in the morning, even if life is hard and everything's going wrong, try to find something to be grateful for. Uh, at least being alive, at least having a future, is very, very important. So I want to make sure I do, I express my gratitude and I generate gratitude and I really, really want to thank uh, key people behind the scenes that have made uh, this event possible. Um, so first, uh, uh, Vice uh, Chancellor, Richard Barnett, who really, I, I found out after making this, so that's why his photo is not there. I found out that actually has worked behind the scenes a lot to make this happen. Uh, Professor Pauline Murphy has been working on this for at least three years in a way. Uh, Professor Brandon Hammer is here, uh, Duncan Morrow, and also uh, Paul Carmichael. Um, so thank you so much uh, from, from the bottom of my heart. And thank you to all of you for being here today. And I hope you can stay until 1 o'clock, because it's when I finish talking that the real thing will happen. OK. Overview of what I have to say today. Um, 15 years of the Belfast Agreement, is, it's today. It's not yesterday. It's not tomorrow. It's, it's right now, right here. Uh, I want to say a few things about that. I, I believe it's an achievement of global, not just Northern Ireland, but the whole world, and historic not just this decade, but for hundreds of years, the event of, uh, accomplished by the uh, Belfast Agreement is, is pretty rare, actually, the triumph of, of dialogue when there was no hope for dialogue. It's, it's I think, global and historic proportions. Uh, then I will uh, give a, try to give a summary of Dasaguikeda's philosophy of community building, philosophy of peace. As Pauline explained, um, the reason why I, I got into this research is because of the actions of Dr. Ikeda, of uh, how can one human being get people motivated around him to create two universities, a whole school system, peace between Japan and China, 192 countries with grassroots movement. What are the basic values and principles that everybody can use that, has motivated, that have motivated this man? That's my question. So uh, it's going to be a little bit of theory, not really practice, but please keep in mind that all the principles and values have given uh, birth to institutions and campuses and, and organizations all over the world, which is what really matters. Um, then I found uh, actually lots of links between the Belfast Agreement, Northern Ireland, and Dr. Ikida, so we're going to see that. And then I have uh, many questions for you, uh, but the main question is uh, what would you like to see uh, on April 10th, 2018? In five years, we'll meet again, all of us here, and then we'll have, am I going to give the same speech? Like nothing changed? I don't think so. What do we want to see in five years? That we can see, wow, the Belfast Agreement really, really worked. We were able to implement everything that was promised. So how do we do that? So that would be my final question. I ask you in advance so you can think about it while I speak. Um, so I think, you know, 15 years old, it's, pretty, uh, it's a tremendous achievement. Um, maybe we can just think and breathe a little bit in and out for just a few seconds about what it took to get there. You know, the 30 years of intense suffering and, and death and de deprivation and, and fear that um, kind of all of a sudden, of course, there was a build up to the agreement, but let's say, let's take 98 as the cutoff line, 30 years of intense suffering, and then all of a sudden, a much better life for everybody. So let's think just, just briefly. Um, all the people who lost their lives or, you know, um, got hurt, um, 3,600 dead, 100,000 hurt, 50,000 in prison. According to some calculations, 500,000 people directly affected in a population of 1.8 million. That's more than a quarter of 
us in this room directly af affected. Transgenerational uh, trauma. You know, even if you're born after the Belfast Agreement, if daddy and mommy talks about, talk about what happened and they start crying every day, it's in you, as if you were there, you know. So let's think about that a little bit, a uh, few seconds. And then we come to 98 and, and a clear break. Um, direct violence has, has gone way, way down. And then um, 15 years of achievements, things have happened. But do you really feel sincerely that everything that should have happened has happened? Do you really feel that today everything that was promised in 98 has been done? Or do you feel a lot has to be worked on? We should, we need more? <laughs> okay. So um, again, a few seconds, you know, you can breathe in and out, you can just think about it. Um, it was fantastic, it was a clear difference, life is much better, but I think we can do much better. Why do I say we, I've, I'm only here a week? Well, I'm geography based. I believe citizenship should be granted to anybody who lives anywhere. So I'm here now, I'm, I'm from North, Northern Ireland, I'm a Northern Irish man for one week. And then when I go home to Honolulu, I'm an American, or actually I'm part of the independent kingdom of Hawaii under military occupation. <laughs> <laughs> and when I go to Japan, I became Japanese, you know. So we are all Northern Irish men and women here. Um, I think we can do much better. The people can do much better than, than has been done so far. Is it perfect? Well, the political pr framework, I think, is really brilliant, because we did the same in Belgium. The Flam I'm a Walloon. I'm a French-speaking Walloon. I am not a French frog. I am a Belgian frog. <laughs> so I'm from the south of Belgium, a Walloon, and uh, we've had, um, you know, problems with uh, the Flemish-speaking Flemish in the north, and they've had problems with us. Uh, but what we've done, we've diluted power. So if you want to get your bicycle fixed, you have to ask a certain office in the government. If you want to get rid of nuclear weapons, it's another one. If you want education, it's another one. If you want uh, foreign affairs, it's another one. It's very confusing. You have to really study the map of politics to know where to go. But the advantage of that is no community feels that the other community has total power on them. It's completely diluted. And we've, we've done that. So when I read the, the Belfast agreements, oh, it looks familiar. That's really a good way of doing it. You know, the danger is that if one community has too much power on the other, things always turn violent at some point. So, so that was a brilliant move to kind of dilute power. Um, the very, something that the whole world uh, looks at with amazement is that uh, you can have an Irish passport and you can wave it and be proud of that. You can have a British passport and you can wave it and you can be proud of that. And you can have both and you can wave them and you can be proud of that. That is fantastic, you have no idea. You live with that every day, but seen from outside, it's just uh, spectacular, and it's really a model for the world to follow. I have a Belgian passport. If I go to Japan, I have to show this. To America, I have to show this. It's like really confusing. Um, so low levels of di direct violence is a great accomplishment. But what about social and economic justice? There's no more, uh, no more domestic violence in Northern Ireland. It's all gone. Uh, everybody feels equal, empowered. Everybody has the same job opportunities. I'm asking you. You tell me later. Um, then that's, that's levels of structural violence. If the answer to all those questions are, well, not everybody feels empowered and equal yet, then there is something wrong. There is structural violence here. Um, what about trust, equality? You can walk down in any part of Belfast. You can walk and say whatever you want, and people will, hey, high five, or you know, hug you. Everything's cool. You, we trust each other. Uh, human rights are protected. The quality of life is very high or not. Something needs to be done about that. What about the levels of cultural violence? People feel interconnected with each other. There is a, a, sh a strong notion of a, a shared future. If not, then there's still something wrong within <coughs> each of our hearts, and that's definitely cultural violence. So um, the world is watching you. You know, everybody knows about the Belfast Agreement. Everybody has heard and sung Bono songs and watched movies. And so everybody knows what's going on. And, um, but nobody knows really how, what you have to go through every day. 
and the frustration of having this, this incredible opportunity, but most people I talk to uh, don't feel it's really implemented properly. There are blockages, there is a lack of enthusiasm, there's, there's people who are getting really tired of the, of the, the whole thing. Um, so it could go wrong, could go back. Uh, you know, when, when Bono sings his, his famous song, uh, Bloody Sunday, he talks to the audience during the lyrics when there is a drum solo and everything, and he says, uh, we're not going back there, many times. And I think that's great, and I think everybody feels like that. We're not going back there. But where do we go from now is the next question. You know. And the world is watching. Um, so I was doing a little bit of research um, to try to at least have something to say, because I really am totally ignorant about life here. I've never been here before. And I discovered that the chancellor of the University of Ulster, Dr. James Nesbitt, is a fantastic actor. And uh, I watched one of his movies, uh, movies he, he's, uh, he's the main uh, actor in that movie, Bloody Sunday. And then there is a song, there is a mural, but of course then I discovered that there is a BBC documentary called Bloody Friday, which represents just the flip side. And you know, <coughs> so um, a lot has uh, been endured during the, the troubles. But uh, a first step towards the creation of value is that it can be transformed into art. So it's, you know, when, when suffering, intense suffering happens, instead of continuing or instead of uh, making things worse, if you transform it into art, it's already better than nothing. It's not perfect, but it's already a step forward in the direction of life. That's what I believe. So the fact that, I mean, I think it's a fantastic movie, uh, is an example of value creation. So since uh, in Buddhism, Everything is interdependent. All human beings are interdependent with each other. If you make a list of the people who made your clothes, who brought your coffee or your tea from where it was made and everything, I mean, there's hundreds of people that we have to be grateful to. We are all interdependent. Based on that, that very flexible um, way of looking at, at all those um, quarks and leptons dancing around and being interconnected, we can always decide what to do next. We can always change the situation for the better, and that's called creating value. Now, this concept of creating value, value is very important for my presentation, because in, Jap in Japanese, when a human being takes the circumstances is in, and or she's in, and creates something positive, creates value from suffering, from uh, joy, make it better. If it's suffering, make it something valuable. It's called soka in Japanese, soka. And the worldwide organization of which Dr. Ikeda is the president is called Soka Gaka International. So it's basically the international association of people who've made a commitment to create value. And um, that's uh, a Buddhist organization. But I think the capacity to create value is not a Buddhist thing. It's for everybody. Every human being on the planet has what it takes to create value. So create value through art, uh, turning poison into medicine, that lots of our um, medication is based on poison, <coughs> actually. So uh, what is Daseko Ikeda's philosophy of, of peace and community building? Uh, I see three major pillars. First, inner transformation. Second, dialogue. And finally, global citizenship. So I read uh, 10,000 pages of his writings. I condensed them into my book. And then I condensed the book into one page. So if you want to read the book, please go ahead. But if you don't have time, this is it. <laughs> so you start with individual peace and move all the way to world peace. And the, the question to ask is, what can I do? What can I do here and now? What can I do for peace around me, for peace in the world? And if you start with inner transformation, you'll be tremendously empowered because you can always change something within. So uh, it's really about personal development. And how do you bring out uh, qualities that we all have, like courage, wisdom, and compassion, and try to make them stronger in ourselves so that we can take action, we can react based on that? Um, absolutely everybody in this room, you can remember a, a time in your life when you were very, very courageous at least once, or very, very wise at least once, or very compassionate at least once. So we have it in us all the time. It's a question of bringing it out. That's the first thing. And in, you know, in Western uh, psychology, it's uh, existential uh, psychology or uh, humanistic psychology, Carl Rogers. It's, it's exactly the same principles. Dialogue, 
um, dialogue, not just having a cup of tea and nice people in a nice room, but how do you bring out the best from in yourself and others through communication? A, a conscious effort to bring out the best in yourself and others. That's the kind of dialogue Dr. Ikeda recommends for peace. For that, you need either transformation, because if you don't feel ready, if you start detesting the person in front of you, you really have to do inner transformation really quickly. Remember that person has tremendous potential. Then go back there and, oh yes, by the way, and continue the dialogue. Um, Jürgen Habermas in, in the West has uh, many theories about participation, deliberative democracy, and dialogue, which are very close to that. And finally, global citizenship. I think you, you all understand uh, what it means. So from a Western point of view, uh, it's nothing new. There's a lot of inner transformation possibilities through psychology, spirituality, or anything you want. Uh, dialogue, everybody's trying hard. And global citizenship, there's many books and theories about it. But the unique thing about Dr. Ikeda is that it's one package that I've never seen anywhere before. Uh, this was actually my, my second PhD exam at the University of Bradford Department of Peace Studies. And one very tough exam question was, well, I don't see any, anything original in that. And I had to really think hard and say, well, actually, that's the only um, philosophical system where you have all three in one. And I passed the exam, so I guess it was a good answer. Uh, yeah, well, we talked about the, the book before. You know what the, the Toda Institute is for. Um, so this is Dr. Dasaku Ikeda. He's um, 85, and he still writes a lot. He um, wrote, he published 60 books of dialogue. One with Gorbachev, one with Linus Pauling, Arnold Toynbee, uh, all kinds of prominent people. And he's writing five or six now at the same time. So he receives a letter, he replies to it, it becomes, and then it's edited, it becomes one more dialogue. He's 85, but he's, he's very busy. Uh, one example of uh, how his philosophy comes into action. You remember in 99, uh, Columbine High School in uh, the United States, uh, two kids walked into the school with guns and killed a whole bunch of other kids and teachers. And um, Dr. Ikeda, together with, with his American team, the SGI members in, in America, they decided to do something about it. And they started a, a campaign called Victory Over Violence, where kids themselves design plays, musicals, songs, and go to other schools and encourage kids to make a commitment against violence in their own life. They, you know, when they grow up, they will never use violence uh, against other human beings. And this movement has worked so well that uh, one million people in the United States have made a, a formal pledge, I will not use violence, and it's pretty long, you have to read it, digest it, accept it, and sign it, one million people. So uh, a few weeks ago on March 16, 2013, based on all these, these efforts of thousands of people in America for the vi Victory Over Violence campaign, Dr. Ikeda was awarded uh, the title of Honorary Principal of Columbine High School. So another example of uh, SOCA, value creation. You know, kids and teachers are murdered just meaninglessly. That is the most terrible thing you can imagine. But still, for the survivors, which is us, we have no choice. We have to create something out of it, so create value. So now there is a movement against violence in the United States. Um, so inner transformation is very important um, because it's the best way to stop violence from spreading. Um, when things go wrong, when you know th there's not enough jobs, uh, unemployment, people are frustrated, nervous, it's very easy to blame another group, any other group. And little by little, you talk with your friends, they all agree with you. We are good, they are bad. We are good, they are evil. And little by little, this builds up and can create tremendous violence like it's happening now in, in different countries. So how do you stop that? Well, um, Buddhism offers um, a view that uh, good and evil are one, but it doesn't mean that good and evil actions, you can do whatever you want. That's not what it means. What it means is that once we feel like that, well, he's wrong or she's wrong, I'm good, that person is evil. We have to make a big effort to remember that that person is probably doing also good things. Maybe that person can sing, can play music, can cook, can drive me somewhere if they are a taxi driver. They definitely can do good things. So they have good and evil in them, depending on what they bring out. Next, I have evil too in, within myself. I feel good compared to that, to that person now, but actually 
I do have evil within myself. I'm, I can be very weak and can be very nasty. I can be very angry. So the division between good and evil is not my side of the wall and their side of the wall. It's the dividing line is within each of us. And if we don't forget that, then polarization, which is the way towards violence and war, polarization will not happen in a society if there are enough people who can recognize that. The dividing line between good and evil is within each of us. And then uh, there is a responsibility for, for those, who, and that's not a Buddhism actually, it's, it's really it's humanism. It's, it's something that everybody can understand and, and practice. Dr. Ikeda had dialogues with um, many people, like, like I mentioned, including uh, Betty Williams from Northern Ireland. And dialogue, um, continuing on the same line, it's a responsibility to bring out the best in yourself and others through the dialogue. <coughs> so through the dialogue, you really make a conscious effort that, okay, we both have good and evil, it's all mixed, and I want to bring the best out of myself, and I empower you to bring the best out of yourself. So again, to avoid polarization. And finally, global citizenship. Um, I'd like to share four short stories. Um, about one definition of global citizenship. Um, so in the bottom, in the bottom uh, left, you can see different little pamphlets. Um, and there are some of them on the table there, about that size. And those are the peace proposals Dr. Ikeda published every year since 1983 until this year about ideas to improve the situation in the world and to make the United Nations more effective and things like that. Those are called peace proposals, really promoting uh, global citizenship. And uh, an Under Secretary General of the UN, uh, Ambassador Chaudhuri, uh, repeats many times, Dr. Ikeda is the only human being who's been supporting the United Nations from 1983 without interruption. Ambassador Chowdhury continues that even former secretary generals, once they retire, you don't see them anymore usually. But this man has supported the United Nations for 83, you know, since 1983 uninterruptedly. Um, and basically those pamphlets talk about global citizenship and how to accomplish it. So feel free to take any of those uh, copies of the uh, peace proposals which are there on, on the table. And now four little short stories about what I think is global citizenship. So first, um, 2,500 years ago in, in India, Shakyamuni um, told a, a story. There is this uh, very powerful monster, which was talked about in the message by Dr. Ikeda. Her name is uh, Kishimojin. She has thousands of children, thousands. But she can only feed them with other children. They don't eat anything else. So she's very busy hunting kidnapping other people's children and giving them as food to her own children. That's what she does. And of course, it's a story, but it's a story. Storytelling is very important. Um, so Shakyamuni is really concerned about that. It's, wow, uh, how can I stop this woman wreaking havoc you know, all over the place? And then, he, and then I'm, I'm improvising a little bit, but he comes across a little child who says, I'm, I'm lost, mommy, mommy. Oh, you're lost? Uh, what's your name? Oh, I am uh, John Kishimojin. Oh, you one of the kids of the lady there? Yes, where's mom? Okay, I'm, I'm going to go and find her. So could you wait, please? Come here, the toys and everything. Hold on a second. Shakyamuni goes and finds the mother, and he wants to tell her he found her kid. But before he speaks, she goes, Shakyamuni, help me. I lost my kid. I counted all of them. I have 1,625. 1, There's one missing, and I think it's the youngest one. Have you seen him? I'm really, really worried, I'm really, I don't know what to do, and she starts crying. So he sees a teaching moment, and he tells her, well, I can see you're really, really concerned, and you're really sad, and you're really suffering because your child is missing. Well, yes, I am. Are you in touch with your own pain right now? Well, are you kidding? Okay, can you imagine how the other mothers feel? Dong. By the way, your kid is at home, come with me. You know. And she totally changed her behavior from that time. She realized what she was doing because she was able to identify with all the other mothers that she was uh, torturing by kidnapping their children. And she became the protector of children. So if you hear about Kishimojin now in China or, or Japan, the legend is about her being the protector of children. 
That's one story from India. Another one uh, from um, Japan. Uh, during the Second World War, Dasaku Ikeda was a little kid, and he saw from far away an American plane being shot down and, and falling into Tokyo, but crash landing. And he could see that the pilot wasn't killed, but he had to go and there was a big crowd. And then he heard that um, the military police and the people opened the cockpit and took the American pilot and beat him up, and maybe to death, we, we don't know. But he, he heard that and he was uh, really shocked. So he went home and he told his mother, you know, um, in Japan, in Tokyo, mom, this, this American pilot, of, you know, fesh, crash land, fell, crash landed, and then he was beat up. What do you think? And his mother said, wow, his mother must be very worried about him. So this young kid felt, oh, wow, I thought we were at war with those people. They have mothers too, and they worry about their children just like us. Uh, another story is um, from uh, Northern Ireland, uh, Betty Williams. So three little kids being killed by a car during a uh, demonstration or something related to the troubles. That car was not supposed to, to do that if, if everything was quiet. Those three kids are dead. So she, we could really identify with their mothers. And she organized marches throughout Northern Ireland, marches of mothers. Which side are you, from, are you on? On children's side. There's no side. Everybody's a mother. And the fourth example is the, you, you have all read Victor Hugo's novel, uh, 1793, at the beginning. There's a woman with her chi three children in the forest. She's escaping. Then there's, there is the Republican army, and there is the, um, the Royalist army. And then the Republicans or the Royalists, it doesn't matter, catch her and put a gun to her head and say, which side are you on? And she says, I am with my children. So four stories, it's kind of the same story. When you're a mother, you're a global citizen. Because it doesn't matter what nationality you are or what group or what conviction. You care about your child. You want the best for your child. If your child is kidnapped, you'll be in hell. You, you, want, you, know, you really care about your child. And it's totally universal. So I think it, uh, it's a good way to explain global citizenship. Motherhood is global <coughs> citizenship. Now, for men, let's discuss after this how we, because I don't really have a story for men. And obviously, we can't be mothers. But I think there's something we can do. So a short biography of, of Dr. Ikeda. Um, I already explained this story during the war. He saw, he saw that, that plane. Um, he had, um, his elder brother was sent to China uh, in 37 when Japan started to attack China. He had to go. He really was drafted. And then he was on, on, le uh, he was, um, on leave. So he came home in Tokyo. And he was horrified by what the Japanese army does there. So young Ikeda was really shocked because at school he was told that the Japanese were liberating Asia from the evil Westerners. But here is his brother who went there and he says, the Japanese army is killing civilians, torturing people. It's absolutely horrible and I don't want to talk about it. And so, you know, so he really decided, uh, I mean, that was one of the seeds for him to become uh, a peacemaker in the future. Then his brother was sent back to war and he was killed in action in Burma and never came home, of course. Um, so young Ikeda was 19, top left, met Toda, top right. And it totally changed his life because Toda, he met Toda in 47 after the war. Toda had gone to jail during the war because he was against the war. He knew what was going on. He was against it. Authorities arrested him. He said, I don't care. You can do whatever you want. I, I'm against what you're doing. They put him in jail. So after he came out of jail, he had tremendous credibility for Ikeda. This man knew what was going on. He fought for his beliefs. He went to jail. And now he's organizing little meetings, which have now grown to 12 million people. So he became a disciple of Toda and promised him to really promote world peace. And that's how he ended up meeting people like Nelson Mandela, Linus Pauling, and all those, those dialogues that are happening. So I found so many links uh, between uh, Dr. Ikeda's philosophy and uh, the Belfast Agreement, the city of Belfast and Northern Ireland. Uh, very briefly, uh, in the 99 edition of those peace proposals, he talks about 
uh, Northern Ireland because it's the year after 98, of course. In 99, the Tuda Institute had a conference in New York about the uh, Belfast Agreement in Northern Ireland. In 2006, Dr. Ikeda met Betty Williams. 2009, Dr. Ikeda received uh, an honorary doctorate from Queen's University in Belfast. Same year, Professor Pauline Murphy <coughs> went to Japan. Uh, thanks to Professor Pauline Murphy and the Irish Association, uh, Dr. Ikeda became the first non-Irish member of the Irish Association in 2009. And last year, there was a seminar at INCOR. Yesterday, there was a little class um, at the Magee campus. And today, we have the seminar. So many, many different links. Um, I think I'm taking too much time. Am I, Pauline? No. Oh. <laughs> That's an ironic no, right? I'm trying to learn here. <laughs> yes, it means yes. OK. Um, so I think I will try to march on a little bit um, faster. Um, that's the Tuda conference, and you can see uh, Monica McWilliams there, who is now a professor at the University of Ulster, and you can also see George Mitchell. Uh, so we do definitely have a connection from for a long time. Uh, I live in Hawaii. You can see my apartment there, <laughs> in my swimming pool. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Ikeda, with uh, the members of the SGI in, in Hawaii, created a, a peace garden where people can go and relax, and at the same time, they can learn about peace. And there are little monuments with quotes from people, from Gandhi and very important people in the world, selected. And of course, one of them is from Northern Ireland. So I went there to take a picture before I came here. And if you can see, uh, Gandhi is, is there. Uh, it's very much what Dr. Ikeda believes, too. So. The first step in nonviolence is that we cultivate in our daily life, as between ourselves, truthfulness, humility, tolerance, and loving kindness. Courage, wisdom, compassion, would say Dr. Ikeda, but it's very similar. And then Betty Williams, who uh, really motivated mothers to march and try to stop the violence and received the Nobel Peace Prize in 76. She said, we are deeply, passionately dedicated to the cause of nonviolence, to the force of truth and love, to soul force. To those who say that we are naive, utopian idealists, we say that we are the only realists. Betty Williams from Northern Ireland. She's, she has a presence in Hawaii. Northern Ireland is in Hawaii. <laughs> uh, dialogue with Betty Williams. And uh, Pauline mentions he visited Soka University. One of the things Dr. Ikeda likes to do at Soka University is to plant trees for his friends. And that's how he shows his, his compassion and friendship in action. He does many, many, many things, little details, but still. So this is the Zhou Enlai cherry tree. He met Zhou Enlai in 74 in China. They had a very major dialogue for 30 minutes. And um, when he was in Japan, six students from China were sent by the Chinese government for the first time in the history of post-war China. And they were supposed to go to a Japanese university, but they had nowhere to go. There was a misunderstanding with the Japanese government. So Dr. Ikeda heard about this and immediately, uh, through his connection, said, I'm taking those six students right now. Come to Soka University. So they came to Soka University. One of them, of course, they graduated and everything. One of them became the, the current um, Chinese ambassador to Japan. And the other five are doing really great. So together with those six students, they planted a tree for Zhou Enlai, who was still alive. And he's really delighted about, about this tree, to enlighten Dasaku Ikeda. And it's a very, very important gesture. Imagine there is a tree with your name on it growing somewhere, and people go and see it and water it and stuff. It's pretty neat. So I want to show you a very special tree, which is a Murphy tree. So now Northern Ireland is in Japan, too. So this is a, a sh you know, shorter, the, the Murphy's cherry tree. <laughs> I know you're jealous, but you're going to become all <laughs> prominent peacemakers. You're all going to have trees at Soka University. Just try your best. <laughs> um, I want to read those two quotes. When Dr. Igida became a member of the Irish Association for Culture, Economic, and Social Relations, it's easy, it's alphabetical order. Culture, Economic, Social Relations, Irish Association. He gave a thank you speech. He gave an acceptance speech. And he, he said this, it is my firm belief that those who have suffered most have the foremost right to achieve happiness. 
It is therefore my heartfelt prayer that developments that will lead to establishing a century of peace for all humanity will originate in Ireland. That's a little vague, but it's, it's very serious because when, when he says things like that, things happen. People wake up, take things seriously, things happen. And then himself wants to be committed to the process. So then he said, in this spirit, I would like to express my firm resolve as a proud member of your esteemed association to work with President Murphy and the other eminent members to build together an ideal human world where all people can live in peace and happiness. So he, he doesn't travel anymore, he's 85. But for example, I'm, I'm not surprised that he, he took time to write a message and to send it this morning. Because he promised something to put in to Professor Murphy. Um, just want to quote something from George Mitchell that Dr. Ikeda also believes in. Former Chancellor of Queen's University, Mr. George Mitchell, placed an instrumental role in bringing the conflict in Northern Ireland to an end. He states with conviction, and Dr. Ikeda also believes this, there's no such thing as a conflict that cannot be ended. Conflicts are created, conducted, and sustained by human beings. They can be ended by human beings. And he continues, the inner life of the human being possesses secret reserves of wisdom and strength that have yet to be discovered. I'm confident that as humans, we can continue to forge and develop ourselves. Together, we can become stronger and wiser. And now, more than ever, we must pool our wisdom and join our efforts to meet and overcome each of the aspects of the current global crisis. Because, I'm not going to say if, as Northern Ireland really gets together and continues all the gains from the Belfast Agreement, makes them better and creates a vibrant ideal society, then we can really participate in trying to save the planet. Because why we're not watching, climate change is there. And climate change means the, the global temperature goes up, but in some spots it's incredibly cold. For example, Northern Ireland, Belfast in March, <laughs> first time in 80 years. But it's not only you, it's, it's many, many different places. New York was freezing. People died. I mean, it's like, so something's really, really wrong with our planet, and it's our planet, and there's seven billion of us on it. We have an impact on it. I mean, sorry, there's no discussion about it. I don't want to say exactly what impact, but we do have an impact. There's seven billion of us breathing, eating, driving cars, doing stuff. Um, so the happier people in Northern Ireland are, the more, and the more empowered they will be to do something about climate change, about nuclear weapons, like maybe you can ask the Koreans to, uh, North, North Koreans to kindly get rid of those things and not uh, point them to Tokyo where my wife is for the moment, and Dr. Ikeda too, by the way. Things like that. So, you know, we are all on, on the same boat. Um, last year's seminar, of course, we mentioned it. So, um, it's one of the many questions I have for you. Imagine, uh, imagine April 10th, 2018, is it the same thing? Nothing happened? That would be extremely discouraging. So let's, let's think a little bit and imagine and emote what's the best that can happen for the whole of Northern Ireland in detail. And not only the political level, of course, everything. The food, the water, the uh, housing, the job, the employment, opportunities the influx of fantastic foreigners from all over the world, so skilled, so interesting, they come and establish themselves here. Imagine whatever you want about how do you really want Northern Ireland to be? And don't say yes, but. Just let that guy who says, that woman that says yes, yes but in your, in your head, let him to sleep for a while, just for two minutes. Just dream, imagine. It's very important because if you don't dream your future, somebody else will do it for you and impose it on you through structural adjustments and all, st all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so it's very important to first visualize where you want to go. So let's do that a few seconds, just breathe in and out. I really appreciate the audience participation because every time I see breathe in and out, you actually do it. I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Something like a vibrant, exemplary shared future. Then let's go back here. Oh, we're here now. 
okay, I saw what it should be in five years, I'm going to make it happen. And now we have to take steps to make it happen. But the hope and the excitement of that fantastic future in five years is right here, right now. It's not, oh, I'll be happy in five years after, after it happens. It's the reverse. Because I, have, I decide to have hope that this is going to happen the way I want, and I'm going to lobby, I'm going to network, I'm going to talk to my friends, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make things happen with nonviolent means, please, of course. Because I decide now that in five years we will be where I, we want to be, I am excited and I'm full of hope here and now. You cannot project your hope in the future because then you don't have hope. It's here and now. So I hope, I hope you're excited. <laughs> so let us not forget what uh, Dr. Ikeda said. He said, um, it is my heartfelt prayer that developments that will lead to um, the establishment of peace for whole humankind will originate in Ireland. Could somebody or several people read the top part um, on, the, on the count of three? One, two, three. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of uh, food for thought uh, with both uh, a good structure and introduction to some of the philosophies and, and ideas behind the psycho Kader's work, um, but also I think posing a lot of questions for us about where we are now and where we might go, and, and I think that that'll be really valuable for the discussion. Um, so thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Um, I'm now just going to call on uh, Dr. Duncan Morrow, who is a uh, lecturer in politics here at the University of Ulster and in the uh, Rhesus Institute for Social Science. Um, most of you, I think, would know Duncan in the room. He was also the former chair of the community, the former CEO of the Community Relations Council. Um, and so, uh, to me, Duncan is uh, one of the foremost practitioners and thinkers about uh, community relations, community development, uh, and social issues in Northern Ireland. So it's, it's a great privilege for us to have Duncan speak and to respond to Dr. Olivier's excellent talk. So Duncan, you're very welcome. Fine. Clap now, you may not want to later. Let's do that. Thank you very much indeed, Brandon. And uh, thank you, Olivier. Thank you for coming here, actually, for making the effort to come. It's great to have you here. And um, thank you all, actually, for turning out today. This is a day when, actually, Paul Nolan, who uh, is working on a project which I was involved in the origins of, uh, is publishing his report on how far we've got uh, for the Community Relations Council. And it is the 15th uh, anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, signing of the Good Friday Agreement. And it is also a day in which the House of Commons is spending time thinking about a very controversial figure globally, and also here, Margaret Thatcher. And there is paradoxes in Thatcher um, for many people, and in a lot of the commentary, the focus on her role in the hunger strikes here in 1981 and the very confrontational position that she took has been one part of the story. And also, the paradox of Margaret Thatcher in Ireland is that Probably without her buying into the Anglo-Irish Agreement, we wouldn't be where we are actually now. And so we are in a, always in a paradoxical situation about this question of how we evaluate the other. And I think that um, that came across very clearly, that we have to go back even when we are at one level of our experience convinced of the uh, rightness of our own cause and the wrongness of the other to something which tells us that long human wisdom tells us something else, which is that the divisions are not quite ever as simple as that. Um, I uh, have uh, kind of so many things I could talk about in relation to what you've just said, and probably a lot of it will come out of the conversation. In the day that's in it, what I want to do a little bit is try to connect a wee bit some thoughts, and they are a little bit incoherent, but. Um, uh, around this whole question of peace building and what uh, Zaku Kato actually has to say about that stuff and how it connects to stuff that I myself have been thinking about, but obviously drawn on other things. 
and then a little bit on where we have got in 15 years since the Good Friday Agreement, just to give it some kind of focus, and then conclude with some reflections on, on that. I've been told I'm not allowed to move, so if I'm moving too much, you can just shout in the back. As I say, um, <coughs> this question of, um, of how we engage globally and how we engage locally, I think, is really very important. And the very fact that you're here talking to us about the level of infrastructure that exists around the thinking of Disaku Akedu is, uh, and yet that is, has been certainly until Pauline became a great evangelist for telling us all about it, um, largely hidden, I think, in the Western world from view. And I think that that tells us something about uh, the nature of the dialogue that we have had up to now and that we're going to have as the world gets smaller. Uh, this, in the internet age, is the way things are going to go. And so this question of dialogue, this question of the quality of our dialogue, this question of what we mean by dialogue, as opposed to just talking at each other, is, I think, incredibly important and is a measure of something which is in itself a precursor of the future. The fact that oh, we don't know, and yet when listening to what this Kedu has to actually say and what you talk about, Olivier, uh, recognises that <coughs> actually we are, would be dishonest if we didn't say that we recognise that even as each situation and each circumstance is unique, we recognise the human dilemma around how do we live together and how do we find a way to make this a better place uh, as actually the same. There is a huge continuity between even this hidden language, if you like, of uh, Japanese Buddhist thought, which has taken on a global context and a place in Belfast where that has probably been one of the places where it hasn't penetrated in any great cultural depth, but yet we recognize it. We recognize it entirely as the human dilemma. The Greek um, philosopher uh, Heraclitus, who was one of the pre-Socratics, so way, way back, um, came to the conclusion that actually something rather depressing. He said, uh, violence is the father of all things. He essentially said that in human power structures, everything goes back to how far you can assert yourself <laughs> and how far you can impose yourself on circumstance. And therefore, political power, authority, success, efficiency, effectiveness, all of these things that we think are worth having are effectively determined by the extent to which you can use and apply violence. And that is, has been actually pretty persuasive across most political philosophies, actually implicitly for most of the time in the world, that we measure ourselves by the extent of our empires. We measure our success by the degree to which we grow big companies. We measure our success by the extent to which people do what we want them to do. And that has uh, profound implications for how we tell each other we should do things in the world. Um, and actually, if we we're to turn it around, at least sets the scale of what you're talking about. That I'm fairly convinced that at an implicit level, even without thinking about it, most of us think that is the way to get things done. And uh, <coughs> what is interesting actually about Ikeda, and interesting actually in its connectedness with Christian thought and Judeo-Christian thought as well, which is the kind of dominant thinking of the Western world, is uh, that this connects, th that essentially Ikeda is saying something very different, actually. He's uh, essentially saying that creativity and, and uh, human possibility exists in peace, if you like, rather than in violence. It exists, it comes from the other side. And that is, I think, what I want to put in front of you to start with is, it's pretty radical. It's, it's, this, it's a radical choice, that choice, which is simply to say it isn't true. And in the Christian version of this is actually at the beginning of John's Gospel, where he says the Logos, the beginning of the end of the world is love, which is essentially the same point, which is that the beginning and the end of things, the Logos, is not violence. The beginning and the end of things is love. The beginning and the end of things. And we, I think, have lost the radical edge of that choice. And actually, how, in broad terms, we mostly don't really believe it. <laughs> we mostly think we have to return to forcing our way through the thing. And so 
I'm not going to talk about it in any great depth here, except to say that I think that this call to peace is both something which people recognise profoundly as important and respond to, and yet turning it into something real and consistently sticking with it is incredibly hard. And I think we are not honest if we don't understand how difficult this uh, connection actually is. Can I say as well that I think that it has this thinking has actually infected the whole way we understand peace and even in this kind of university context. Because there are obviously lots of ways of talking about it, but if I want to, for my purposes, draw two models of possibility. There's one which very clearly is concerned with eliminating that surface violence that Gal Tung talks about, in which the core first thing to do is to stop people killing each other. And we're not honest if we don't actually recognise that there's something important <laughs> in that actually do and that a lot of political effort, often by balancing violences against other violences, to be honest with you, uh, is put into trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. And it reaches its climax in the mutually assured destruction of the notion that the main reason why you won't fire at me is because you'll know that I'll fire at you. And that is the best way to maintain peace. But this notion, which is that the absence of violence and that we have to get the structures right and we have to get the order right and we have to get the politics right and we have to get the laws right is been a deep priority in global affairs, partly because it poses very urgent and immediate risks and because it is absolutely right that we have to deal with it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's another context in which peace in all of, I think, the global religions or, of the world talk about this in an entirely other way. They're actually talking about something which is a reality in relationships. It is a quality. It is something which exists in, uh, that we have between us. And it has a positive content. And in philosophical terms, it becomes a question which is devolves around ethics. It's less about uh, the structures and the, um, and the laws and the legislation and the politics. It is about the ethics. And ethics, as a Greek word, is something to do with the recognition of the reality of our shared, our shared existence and reality with others, what we share with the other, with others, and our being human together. And that actually, in all of what we've been talking about this morning, or Olivia's been talking about this morning, there is a sense in which there is no real meaningful peace unless you go back to its ethical core, which starts from the reason why we do this is because there's no other way to be ethical. There is no other way to be human, actually, than to go back to the fundamental recognition that uh, that is where uh, all of our solidarity comes from. But that peace is living in the reality that we know that, that somehow or other we belong together. We are different, and yet we are in some sense of equal value. And that the story that we have to tell is uh, equally a value precisely because it is unique. So I want to say um, just a couple of things about that. I want to say that I think what Ikeda does, Saku Ikeda does, is connect between these two. And I think that, the, that that is important. And I think that uh, it's why I'm glad it's in this university, because I think we are more comfortable normally with the first of those, with describing political structures, with negotiating peace settlements, with uh, talking about we hope there's a recipe for these things and we're going to apply them and we're going to do this, there's going to be disarmament and there's all these different parts, which I very clearly I'm involved in and I'm interested in and I don't want to decry either because I do think it's important. And it comes down to that in the end too. However, 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 I'm also sure that if you don't also find what is the ethical frame within which we are working and we don't talk about that it is uh, simply it's both the origins and why we're doing this to realise a fundamentally ethical principle, then actually it's just one of those things you do. It doesn't have any meaning outside of itself. It's just one of those things you do. And I think there's a tendency sometimes for these things to split and for them, you know, the one becomes woolly and kind of bind us together, Lord, and sandals and all of that side. 
and then on the other side you have the real people who are dealing with the with the missiles and the guns and all of that kind of thing. And neither of those is going to be enough, actually. <laughs> neither of those is going to be enough. We have to talk about how the one transforms the other or the one engages with the other, uh, uh, while still actually, for me, if we're talking about peace, insisting on the primacy of the ethical. On the primacy of the ethical. Which means that sometimes we have to at various times, actually, it is only the mad people who wear sandals who are keeping it going, <laughs> paradoxically. Um, that's not a question of superiority. It's just a question of, uh, of an act of refusal to refuse to go down the other road. And I think uh, holding on to that kind of ethical framework is um, actually the core difference here, the core question here for me. I have to. I, I have a wee section here which I was talking about ethics and ethnics. <coughs> the the thing which kills the notion that we are we have a solidarity between us, of course, is fear and violence. <laughs> Once somebody is shooting at you, the notion that you're equal to them is hard to take, and in the circumstance, it's not really very meaningful because you have to decide what you're going to do about it. And uh, the reality of our situation and what we can usefully talk about if we want to get a little less kind of hung up on what we mean by ethnic uh, and it's not about origins it is we find ourselves on another side of guns <laughs> we find ourselves in a position where that fundamental similarity and solidarity gets lost because it doesn't mean anything when you're under this huge fear and in this community we simply come out of a history in which at the one level we live with a kind of a stated history which talks about ethics and talks about uh, love your neighbor and talks about recognition and talks about uh, solidarity and equality and all this language, but it isn't actually realized in reality. <laughs> you do that against the backdrop where actually you're kind of mad to do so, to believe that. And uh, because it's not actually there. What I like about um, Ikeda's stuff, actually, is there's a line in your book which talks about the broadest and deepest transformation of the real causes of conflict, is that it, uh, it simply says that we will not get about this question either by uh, simply talking ethically and not dealing with these questions, or on the other hand, we'll not get it if we don't connect the dealing with this with an ethical vision, with an ethical purpose. With an, uh, with an ethical commitment, actually, even to begin it. And so the three elements that you talk about, um, there is the dialogical, the dialogue for common humanity, which in a way we've become very comfortable with, actually, here. We do talking. Uh, not necessarily for a common humanity, but we do talking. Okay. Number two, uh, a less clear but somewhere there is this interconnectedness, this sense that there is a, a, a ghost at the feast about a shared future. We talk about it all the time, what we mean about it and what content it has, I think, depends on how you're coming at it. But nevertheless, there is some kind of ghost at the feast, which is we've kind of got to the point that this is only going to work if it's big enough for all of us. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but we're now scrapping over what the balance is going to be in the middle of all of that, with the risk that then we go back to the notion that, well, if we can't have it our way, we won't have it at all. So that is another possibility. There's this inner transformation question, though, which sits at the core of this. And I do think this is both in quite usefully understood, not simply in human terms, but that the measure of this society will be uh, not actually just in the structural changes which you can point to, but by the transformation that is possible in people's lives and in the way we live and deal with each other. And we have kind of set that aside for the politics. But if I was to say there is a weakness in, in our approach to peace, uh, paradoxically, even in a language of reconciliation, it has been that we've not been serious about the level of transformational change that is going to require of us, that it requires us to start from the point that we are all equally valuable and we bring unique to the table and that we won't have arrived until we finish at that point. <laughs> And that's the project. That's the project. And all the obstacles in between, historical, real and equity terms, 
real in uh, justice terms, have to be uh, placed in the middle of that project. And the project is, first of all, a commitment to the value, and second of all, a commitment to the outcome. And everything else is working out how you then deal with what is obviously not uh, got clear within that project. Otherwise, I wonder what kind of peace project we have, actually. So we're 15 years today from the uh, signing of the Good Friday Agreement, which was this kind of moment at which some of this stuff came up, actually. And we need to go back to how fragile it was. I mean, the day before, nobody thought it was going to happen. They were all in. George, it only happened because George Mitchell was going home to see his family on Good Friday, and therefore I set a date and said, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> And so, effectively, he created a timeline uh, to the Thursday. In fact, he was leaving on the Thursday, so it should have been Holy Thursday Agreement. And they let it run over because it was just about there. And anybody who remembers it knows that on the Monday it wasn't going to happen. And on the, they flew in Blair and the Hearn and helicopters, and we had the hands of history, and it all came in. And then that's how it happened. It, but it, it was a struggle. You can see and feel the struggle between this kind of imperative of the ethical, the imperative to deal with the problem, and the reality that what we have to do to change and the was incredibly difficult and choosing to do it and to risk the kind of relationship you were going when you didn't have guarantees was proving enormously difficult. And even when we got out the other side, what became clear and has become clear is we didn't actually resolve it there, even though we got to the point that we at least wrestle with the dilemma, and we can't rub it out either. We can't rub it out either. So we are a kind of people between, I think, now. We know that there is something, and something happened in 1998 and the 10th of April, which effectively said, we are capable of making a deal that's better than where we've been. And that's been a hugely important kind of light for people. On the other hand, uh, we've almost not, uh, this is me speaking now, uh, been able to recognise that's true and that is valuable in itself, but we have to. We now have to go on with uh, working through what that means, rather than simply freezing ourselves in some kind of fight around that deal. We actually have to uh, use the paradoxically what I would call at this point spiritual power of the of the agreement. <laughs> in other words, that recognition that we can do better than this. Um, as a spur for something else, as opposed to a, right, we don't have to bother anymore type of moment, right, we've done it. And I think uh, the 15 year moment and the sober, the sober atmosphere of 15 years is paradoxically, uh, it's got a good side and a bad side. The bad side is, you know, report card not great, should be better, we should be further on than we are now, a lot further on than we are now. On the other hand, it's an incredibly optimistic moment, which is, that mattered, and we have to do something to maintain there. And we cannot and must not allow ourselves to go back to the other side of this, uh, simply because it's hard. <laughs> so I think that I want to say that uh, it, it, is, it is what it is. It was a wonderful moment. There's a couple of things in it I want to draw attention to. I mean, it just it. I think we also need to understand that it emerged in its own way from despair. It was the last possible option. <laughs> it came actually, in my view, given the Margaret Thatcher's role uh, in its first iteration in the Anglo-Irish Agreement. I know that that's incredibly unpopular to say, but the first uh, articulation that reconciliation was the only way forward is in the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985. Uh, effectively, Britain and Ireland saying, we have to be bigger than simply national solutions to this. We have to be bigger than national solutions. And Margaret Thatcher later didn't really like what it did to unionism. And the Republicans didn't like what it does to the Republican dream. But you know something, like it or not, we're all on the same project now. <coughs> we're all on the same project now. And I do think that uh, it, it, but it did so, and you can see the weakness. Effectively, what I think it came from was <coughs> British government accepting that a security solution would destroy them. In other words, they, you could probably do it by putting an army of 55 million against a small population here, but it would destroy any meaningful ethical meaning to the United Kingdom to do so. And it was not, it was not going to be doable. On the other hand, from the Irish point of view, it was a recognition that actually that a simple uh, denial 
of some of the more difficult consequences of, of empire, which are that there are people here who are frightened of other people living on the island of Ireland and of what it means and how they be here. Um, couldn't be solved simply by, by, by a politics of domination. It had to be solved by a politics of cooperation. And I think those are massive things, and I think they're important things, and I think that, but I think that both, both states, out of their own histories, wrestled themselves to there. They got there kind of against our histories too. So there's a, something important in that as well. I think that it came from the exhaustion of people in Northern Ireland. I'm interested that you've got Betty Williams up there. She's kind of a, actually, honestly, a hidden figure here because she was kind of, she was a bit mad and she was just a housewife and all these kind of things. But it's interesting because she clearly connected at the time with vast numbers of people here at one moment, the Marie Corrigan Nuts was, and, and huge numbers of people just wanted peace. They got destroyed by the politics of it. To be honest with you, there was a naivety around it. There was a unconnectedness uh, un, un to it. But I think that they do represent something here, and that what happened on the street demonstration, which is a lot of people here knew we have to find something different. We just have to find what the shape of that something different might look like. And uh, that kind of thing got hidden under. And I think the anglo Irish agreement is, to some degree, the same thing, which was Britain and Ireland coming to conclusions. But it also stimulated in the population, even though people didn't like the politics of it, and we're still there. We're frightened of the political consequences, but at the same time, we, are, we know we have to find somewhere different, and we live between that kind of set of dilemmas. And, uh, but, we, but the old way is exhausted, I have no doubt whatsoever. The old way is exhausted. That's not going anywhere, and it's not going to take us anywhere. The, there are, and, and actually very quickly, it becomes clear what you have. There are a whole series of issues you have to deal with. You have to deal with the quality issues. You have to deal with the fact that there are certain things which keep pushing the scab, which are that some people keep being full, keep getting pushed down. You have to deal with security questions. People have to know that when they make changes, they're going to be safe. Uh, you have to deal with uh, future questions. Uh, you know, how are and what are we going to educate our kids with? <laughs> and you have to do something about how people relate to each other in everyday life, which is what we would call community relations here, but essentially, you know, that there are open doors here, not just shut doors. And that the Peace Project must deal with all of those questions. And I think that that becomes really clear very early on. It uh, certainly inspired people who are further away. In other words, when you have no interests in Northern Ireland, it's very obvious <laughs> that peace is the way forward, when you have an interest though it is much harder because you have a sense that you're losing something. So internationally, it's easier to like than if you're here. It also demands of us that after years of killing each other, we stop, we, we, we decide to be ethical with each other. In other words, we look at each other and say, you're my brother and sister, actually. I could have done what you did, even though I did it. <laughs> even though you did it. And furthermore, then looking at the victim saying, and I did something which you shouldn't have had to bear. You should not have had to bear. And those are hard things to have to say. <laughs> For somebody who killed somebody or was involved in a conspiracy or supported a conspiracy to kill somebody, you have to look at the people who killed them and say, you had to bear something you shouldn't have had to bear. It shouldn't have happened. On the other side, the rest of us have to look at the people who did it and say, and honestly, one, a lot of you did things which we actually approved of. And number two, if we'd have been in your position, we'd probably done it too. Now, those are weak ethical positions to get to, but I'm pretty sure we know them already. <laughs> My own feeling is I'm pretty sure we know them already. The question is how do you articulate that kind of thing into politics, and then where do you go from there once you've acknowledged that? So I do think that uh, we are, that there was a huge change which allowed a lot of this to come out, can I say, and I, I'm, I'm aware I could talk for too long here, so I'm going to go kind of move myself a lot forward more quickly. Let me just say that I think what it did was it created a big enough international coalition. If we're honest about it, it wasn't driven by people trying to love each other. It was driven by politicians deciding that actually once this coalition of people deciding this was the only way forward, uh, they had to adjust to it. It was militarily nonsense to keep going when you hadn't a chance of winning. It was, uh, the, and in many ways, our politicians on a lot of sides, not all, and it's not fair, and not at all times, 
but were screaming and kicking dragged into it and eventually went with the spirit of the thing and there was a moment of decision and, and it happened. It has wonderful words in it. Actually, the Good Friday Agreement, if you look at it now, is a, wor a work of wonder in many ways. It has things which say, would you believe in the middle of a flags protest? It says that we are, we all who are from here, but I don't know, you may, because you're here, as you say, you're a citizen of us today. So we have the right to be, we have the birthright to be British and Irish or both as we may choose. <laughs> so actually, after signing up to this, none of us have any right to tell anybody anything about that. That's not a matter of comment. That's a fact. Furthermore, that no matter what the jurisdiction operating in Northern Ireland, this right cannot be taken away. Now, actually, I don't think people have really understood just how internationally, juridically radical that statement is. That basically says that in, uh, in one country, you're allowed to be a citizen of another country forever. <laughs> forever. And it's a loyal act. It's not an act of disloyalty. It's an act of your birthright. That is massive breakthrough in international law. Um, but we have really underplayed it, partly because we didn't really want to know. But essentially, no matter what flag flies over there, <laughs> that's what we've agreed. Every Sinn Féin voter who is in support of this deal has accepted that British people are here to stay. Not people who are Irish who think they're British who one day will become <coughs> Irish. <laughs> but British, if they choose it. Or both. You can be both, which is also actually, I think, a bit more difficult for people. How can you be both? Uh, I am. I have a problem. Uh, the, then you're Irish. That means that in Northern Ireland, it is not disloyal to be a card-carrying, loyal Irish person. You're allowed to be here. And you're allowed to be here on equal terms with everybody else who's here. Now, that is pretty big. <laughs> uh, and I, continue, I go back to it and I'm going, so what's the row about here? <laughs> Furthermore, it says it would be wrong to change the border without the consent. Not just it, we won't change it, it, it would be wrong. <laughs> so everybody signed up to that. From every nationalist has agreed, we don't want to do this, we're not interested in this now, we accept the border as it is. However, when there is a majority, it'll go. It says that. It's all in the book, it's all actually written down. I don't know whether people would like to recount from it now, but theoretically, that's what we all signed up to. It also says that we have reconciliation as the goal. It says that the best thing we can do about the past, which is terrible, and it acknowledges it in general terms, is not do it again <laughs> and build something different. It says purely democratic and peaceful means and that everybody will oppose it, not just in themselves, but when anybody else does it. So it is not possible to support anybody going on the street <laughs> using violence if you're in this government. You have to go if you, if you want to. But this system says we have signed up to that. That is its cornerstone. So you can't support anybody who does that and we support the rule of law, and we have parity of esteem, and we have human rights, and we have equality, and we have shared housing, mixed housing and shared education. That's what it says in the, in the document. So there are a few things that I haven't kind of followed through on. <laughs> but as a document, what we got was that, with a sense that while we had signed an ethical document, if you like, and agreed an ethical frame and brought something into bearing, which is now our test, which is, but we're still left actually with uh, what might be called in unethical or ethnic approaches. And so we still are in that space where without the inner transformation, if you like, using the framework that is here, uh, that that hasn't happened. And we have to be clear that once we become frightened, the ethic, it's, it's not that people are acting unethically in the sense, but the ethics of somebody who is frightened and under violence are almost the opposite here. The good people, basically you say that the other is guilty. Once you start from that position that the other is bad and is a real threat, for which there is ample evidence, to be honest, in this country. And it's why you need, we still need um, 
these dividing walls through the city of Belfast is because people are convinced, for better or for worse, that there is a real threat out there. And actually, 15 years on, we should be asking the question, are they right? In which case, what are we doing about it? Or are they wrong? In which case, they're suffering from a very prolonged post-traumatic post stress disorder, which needs to be addressed. But actually, I suggest that they're probably right in the first case, there is a real threat. Which means, then, we need to be doing something about it, <laughs> actually. Not just saying that people will wait till people are happy and we'll take them down. No, no. We will do something about the threats which make them unhappy, and then something might occur. But the ethics of we are under threat say, then, heroism is the person who stands up for me in that situation, not the person. So, so the person who is most violent and most willing to go to their death for me is the person who is the most heroic. So violence becomes not a bad thing, but actually the necessary thing. Furthermore, th there is no justice if you ask me to make peace with those people who are destroying me because it's like asking a victim of child abuse to, be ab to live with their abuser and pretend nothing happened. It's not right. And justice looks like victory. And furthermore, anybody who's telling you differently is trying to betray you. They're betraying you to their ethnic enemy. So I would like to suggest that the part of the problem is as long as fear is in the equation, as long as we don't state that we are giving up on the notion of the good guys and the bad guys here, and we are trying to create a criticism mm -hmm. which is ethically framed, unless there's something in politics which, which makes that the clear goal of what we're about, then uh, we are inevitably in a situation in which there is an ethical discussion out there, but who are the, who are the truly ethical people? The truly ethical people are the people doing the violence, the people who, who are refusing to compromise, and they are the ones who, and the people who are the problem are the betrayers and the peacemakers. And that is, an, it's, as long as violence and threats in the game, th that is a profoundly plausible argument. Profoundly plausible in, pra in pl practical political so terms is where an inequity is identified, for example, say in housing, Protestants voting to get the houses built <laughs> because it's equitable. Uh, or if we see an educational underattainment, Catholics will to say, well, we need to address that one, but addressing it because we need to address it, <laughs> rather than the other way around. That's what that looks like. And in our political terms, it's still extremely difficult for a politician of either side to go and say, I delivered more education money to them, or I delivered more housing money to them. It's very hard, hard uh, electorally for anybody still to do. But I think what it did was, what that definition does for me is capsulate one, where progress needs to be measured, but two, um, we have to ask the question why those are the very things we can't deal with. <laughs> those are, that literally sums up the things we can't deal with. Uh, shared vision of the future, dealing with the past, building positive relationships, community relations, which have just been emasculated, uh, attitudes, dealing with cultural attitudes, parades or whatever you like, but all those kind of things, and dealing, tackling the equity questions. That, that literally, so essentially, if you, if you move outside it now, you'd have to say, we want to, to have a political system without dealing with those things. <laughs> and I suppose to take it back to here, I want to say, I think what the whole is, is actually in going back to the ethical question of what we mean by peace building. We have to drop the language. It's not just a structural question. It is actually a question of who are we as human beings? How does this become a human society? What are the tasks? And it, requ it will require all of these practical things. But we have to recover something of the, the statement which is that every human person counts. And that we have to uh, go back to that as a core ethic. <laughs> and we have to make our politics somewhere from there. Now, I think I really will shut up now because I've talked for far too long. I just want to say this. I think this is, uh, for too long in peace studies, we've thought of this ethical part of it as the kind of nicey-nicey bit or not connected it into real world and not connected into the real world or the other way around. We want to deal with the real world issues and all that stuff. You, don't need to actually, you actually don't need to do that. I don't think either of those are, for me, tenable positions. We will have to deal with some ethic, really hard ethical questions. This isn't a question of some things are hard and some things are soft. It's a question of some things are hard, which are the basic things of getting schools and things to people and 
services and dealing. And some things are harder, and they're harder because they require us to change at a deeper level. And I think it's harder and harder. And I think we need, uh, if there's been a political failure, that's one thing. I actually think the, and I'm talking as a, as a practicing Christian, uh, is the spiritual side has been even weaker. Very, very poor. I think we have not really put into the, into the place a, uh, a sense which is that we all have to serve this question of what does it mean to be human? What, what does it mean to, how do we create a society in which that is the core value? And what do our traditions who are from outside bring to that? And I have to say that I think that uh, we need to talk about uh, some kind of frame for this discussion. Creativity for me will be measured in the existence of three things. One is a promise. We can make promises to each other about the future which we actually deliver on, which are not necessarily just contracts and deals. They're actually commitments. We will stop this. Uh, so when we start to do that, that's a good thing. And people being able to make promises to each other as permanent partners do, as real people do. Uh, something which is not great political language, but mercy and compassion, which looks like that when we could take the pound of flesh, we don't. We actually try to make space for people to work into different spaces. And we recognize that people are coming out of complex situations. And we acknowledge the difficulty for them to move. And we, so there's that as well. So we look at people there. And then something even harder, which is uh, articulated in my language by the word forgiveness, which in this case means that we recognize the humanness of the perpetrator, actually. <laughs> we recognize the humanness of the perpetrator, but also we acknowledge the uh, scale of the damage done to people, which they didn't earn, which they did not earn. Uh, and so I think we have to make this unambiguous commitment to sharedness. I would like to talk about what is the ethical frame for discussion, what are we actually trying to do. I think we need, finally, to ritualize this. I don't think we have celebrated the Good Friday Agreement for its change that it made for us, because I don't think we wanted to acknowledge that we, ha we had all changed 15 years ago. I actually think you will find loads of a discussion going on here about a decade of centenaries, which is we are now facing into a decade where every year is 100 years since some terrible event where we hated each other more 100 years ago, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and we celebrate the fact that we murdered a few people around it and we committed to murdering each other in it. Well, that's what we did. And <laughs> that's what, and, and they have been formative in our cultures. And we celebrate them all the time. We have nothing in the public space which says we stopped. We stopped. We're doing something different now. That was us. It's still important. It shaped us. It was all part of who we are. I'm not against people remembering that at all. And I also want to say, and we stopped. Or did we? <laughs> or did we? And I don't know, I don't want a softy, softy, nighty, nighty moment. I want us to say we took an incredibly difficult decision, which was with all sorts of justification, we committed to violence, which we believed in and we thought it was necessary. And we came to a point in 1998 at which we decided that was no longer the way to go and we have changed. <laughs> and that that is okay to say. And that we have that as a, a some, that there is something in the public domain. I don't know what it is, which acknowledges that. Can I say there's huge similarity in what Akeda says with the core traditions of what peace must be about here? What does it mean to be human? I think the fact that somebody comes and can describe some of the core issues to us from outside in this way tells us that that is the dialogue at a global level we have to be having. That is what we're trying to struggle with here and the truth we need to hear. I think I am most impressed, funny enough, by the fact, and I think this is another connection with the Christian tradition, is around this question of, of a kid of mentoring and modeling. And my own feeling is actually, it isn't just dialogue, it is actually demonstration. We have to get past show, uh, telling to showing. And part of the issue of ordinary people doing small things and the local is we have to find where it happened. 
you have to tell the stories that you're telling, you have to plant your little cherry trees as effectively what they are, they cherry trees, and at another level, they are a continued commitment to continue doing that, even in the middle of global warming, you keep doing that. And I think that consistency and persistence of uh, the modeling and mentoring, and I think that what I like about this is the huge amount of demonstrative effort that has gone into it. I think we, uh, that will require a, a degree of, of patience, a degree of, of persistence, a degree of discipline, and probably a degree of suffering, I have to say. But I have to also finish by saying that I think that if we're serious about peace studies, one of the learnings that's coming out of this is that the interconnectedness of the ethical with the practical is the debate that we have to have. And it's certainly where 15 years on in the Good Friday Agreement, this community is. And so thank you very much for introducing that conversation to us. Thank you very much, Duncan. That was very rich and I think raised a, a range of challenges for us. And I think the talking about the two, the ethical and, and, and the real, uh, next to each other, which is not necessarily the right words, but um, it really does pose a significant amount of challenges. So we have a fair amount of time for questions. So what I'm going to propose is maybe take a few now um, that people have sort of burning questions, and then maybe we'll just take a short uh, comfort break. Um, and then maybe come back uh, for, for, for some more questions. Um, uh, we have a roving mic here to pick you up when you're speaking, um, but we actually don't have one on the table, so you probably need to respond here. Yeah, I know, but th that'll be for the, the people. Oh, you, you want us to go there? Yeah, so you'll have to respond right, right. here. Um, yeah. So, yeah, well, we can, we can, we can do that. What, I, what I'm going to do is take sort of three questions at a time and then give you time to respond. Uh, maybe that's a, that's a way to, to do it. So, are there any questions? One at the back? Okay. My name is David Smith. I'm public policy officer at the Evangelical Alliance. Um, Duncan, my question is for you. Um, and it's, you. You didn't use the word grace, but you talked about not, not getting your pound of flesh whenever you, you could go after that. Um, I'm interested in how we bring grace um, into quite a prideful environment of politics in Northern Ireland, where empire and power um, and, and dominance are very much seem to be at the forefront. Uh, have you any suggestions as to how uh, this, this attitude of grace could be introduced into the political system? Uh, how we could do that? Kay. So there's a question over there and then uh, one over here. So we'll take that one in this one. Hi, I'm Renee. I'm French. I have a question for Oliver. You said that the film Bloody Sunday was a transformation into art um, of a conflict. And I would like to know what's your definition of art. And I also wanted to know if, um, in your opinion, if uh, Paul Grant's aim was to do art. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then one over here. Hi, uh, my name is Rushi McLung. Um, I work in interfaces. So maybe people speak up because I think that, that we're picking that up on the machine, but it's not maybe the not uh, amplifying it. So. Okay. Can you hear it now? Yep. Um, my name is Rosie McGlone. I'm a chief executive of an interface organization in Western North Belfast um, who deal very much with the, the, um, the coal face. And it's very interesting discussion, but my question is more of a sort of a practical level. We have this environment where it's us good, them bad. And we see it across a number of levels. It's not just across the communities. It's between the police and, and whatever. And I was dealing with a few issues last night, and it just showed to me how different people's stories of the same event will be very different. 
And I suppose my question is, and I'm, I'm grappling with this all the time, everyone seems to assume that the actions of the other are for the worst reasons. And I'm wondering where we generate. Politics isn't doing it for us, and it's not going to do it for us, and I'm interested in you know, the answer to the question there about grace. It's not going to do it for us in the short term. Where do we generate the examples of people that are prepared to transcend that because we haven't got them? Right, let's take those those three. Um, I don't know who would like to? Well, maybe you, uh, you, okay. Gillian, maybe we, they could just sit there and then we could use that. That's right. Or oh, can you not see them, Mike? Is that okay? Okay. So maybe just sit there then. Don't that's probably easy enough. Okay. Okay. Might make it a bit more, a bit less hokey cokey. Um, okay. Uh, in a way, they're similar and related questions about how. Um, these um, something different is made manifest into the middle of the situation. Actually, uh, either way, if it's uh, grace, is it uh, in art? Is it in uh, actual real life? How do you actually tell these stories in different ways? A um, couple of things, and these are just comments rather than answers. One is, I think, and this is the hugely difficult danger is and it's something I kind of ask myself as well, which is how do you approach politics without engaging in a, politic, in a political way, if you like, in other words, in, the, in that same old model of, uh, of, of battering people down, but at the same time be taken seriously, that you're addressing the issues which, they are, which politicians are trying to face. So I think there is a big dilemma in that, which is, we have to be, there's something, first of all, if you're talking about how you are in politics, which is, it's not about being against politicians, it's not about joining in, it is about, but on the same time, it is about being clear about the, the issues or the, the things which are being forgotten about or which are being denied. And actually, um, I think all you can do is, is go and, 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 and try to speak your truth in a certain kind of way and then let, you have to let it happen in its own time. Does it happen, does it not? I think that's one of the questions. I don't think it's an it. I think grace is something you recognize afterwards rather than something you can say, you know, you're just going to do your grace now. Um, the second uh, thing is, and I think it has a lot in this terms to do with there are disciplines in, in world faiths and religions which help people with this kind of thing about the how and about the not getting caught up in that kind of direct confrontational rivalry type of thing and about which come out of this, which I think are really important here as you speak from a different place in which something of which, what you were talking about earlier about knowing that it's not about good, bad is present uh, and that makes it present then for everybody. So there's something there. Uh, in your question, I mean, I have to say, I am sitting here on a personal level, deeply frustrated that this has to be, I talked about the mentoring thing, it has to be led. You have to see it, you have to make it visible. Somebody has to, it has to be somewhere visible. The Martin Luther Kings of this world, the Akedas of this world, the, the people who, the Mandelas of this world, the people who, in which we see it suddenly in public life are rare. That's the first thing, but they're real. Uh, people are f find themselves after they meet that kind of a person, this is something like uh, the vehicles of whatever you want to call it, recognition, manifestation, grace, the, the where something changes for everybody, everybody's kind of scrambling to make sense of what just happened there, but something happened. <laughs> and I am deeply frustrated, I suppose, by the fact that our conversation the, the leadership in this community is, is, the, is the word which I'm struck with all the time, except you can't you can't make it happen. People just have to lead. You know, it's 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 one of those things to have a great discussion about. But I have a deep frustration that the polit that having said we want this done by our devolved politicians, that at the moment there seems to me to be personally, if I'm honest with you, an absence of urgency about wanting to lead it, <laughs> wanting to lead it, and I'm not hearing actually a load of other people in formal leadership positions speaking either. Uh, so if you talk about churches or talk about business or talk about any of those kind of things, you know, like, come on, lads. <laughs> and it's mostly lads. 
give us some advice here. Um, that, so that's that. So back to your point, which is, I think then what we have to think about, and art is one of them, definitely. Broadcasting is one of them. Uh, community activities is one of them. Uh, we, one of our tasks at the moment is how do we make this, the, 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 both the, the failings and the possibilities visible now. And I do think we're almost back to that, actually, in our community life. Now, you, w the, the thing you have to live with once you get that far down the pipe is it's not, in the first instance, going to be effective. It is simply going to be doing it because that's what you have to do. And I understand when you're living on the, on the actual interface and where it's actually bricks in the head and where it's actually happening, the kind of need to just stop it at one level is, is so urgent that you have to get on with it. On the other hand, I'm pretty sure that uh, in the short run, that's what we have to do. You have to put up some kind of contrast to this. You have to, to do it. Now, there's not a recipe. I mean, you could do something, I can do something. We can all kind of think about what that might is. It's almost back to look, act locally as in individually, and it has a global impact. I'm, I don't kind of get out of there, actually, in the end. I kind of stick with that, which is there's a primary responsibility to deal with what we can do in our own particular area of life. Um, and at some level, you have to let the rest take care of itself. So that's the kind of a faith position too. You have to let, on the other hand, you have to believe that that is one of the ways in which it comes into the world. And that's mo you, it's almost like if Ireland can do this, you're a kind of dream. Um, you know, that creates a possibility for other people. It's not against other people. It's a possibility for other people. So that's where I am on this, which is, but I, what I, I suppose I'm actually saying is, and it is urgent, and it is urgent. Uh, okay, so the, the, the second question was about uh, art. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't want to give a definition of art because then it's words that explain about word, but I can give you examples. So, um, you know, uh, if you think about songs that you like, uh, music that you like, uh, uh, and then uh, literature, poems, uh, movies. Um, so we, ha we are surrounded by, by art. And uh, something that will be art for some people will not be art for others. And that's okay. We don't have to all agree about what art is. Um, a, f a few days ago, um, uh, you, you showed me uh, an application that's designed by University of Ulster and Incor together, where uh, you, you go to your iPhone. I don't have an iPhone, so I but you go to your iPhone. And then you want to know where the nearest memorial is from here. So you, it opens up and then it gives you a list. And there's a little orange square, or a little green square, or a little uh, blue square, or a little gray square, but they are all on the same page. And then you can decide you want a, a one mile radius, two miles radius, and it's beautiful. And who, the, this um, device does not discriminate about who will be able to look at it. You know, somebody picks it up and looks at it. You are the wrong kind of person. I shut off now. It's not happening. This device will be open to anybody, and you have all the memorials on the same page. And then you can, you can decide yourself which one you want to go and, and visit. Uh, that's a form of art for me. Even, even that is a form of art, because it's organizing sounds, because you can, you can even speak to it. Where is the nearest memorial? Doo -doo -doo, you know. uh, it's sound, it's images. It's, it's put in a certain way in an artificial way to fulfill some kind of purpose or no purpose. But so for me, I have a very, very broad definition of, of art. Uh, definitely that movie is, is art. It's very well made. It's using all the cinematographic uh, tricks to make a movie. Um, and as far as the, the motivation of the director, is that what you were asking? Um, that I think we, have, we need to talk a few hours about that. Uh, why, what I'm going to say now that actually is not relevant is based on a very, very deep philosophy why I'm saying that. Okay. Why it is not relevant is that I really believe that once a work of art is produced, it belongs to the world. It belongs to everybody. So let's say that the director did not want to produce art. It, I don't know, but let's say he didn't want to. So I'm going to make a point, and I'm going to take one angle, and I'm going to sell my products and convince everybody that I'm right. That's not art. That's propaganda. Okay. 
And then he worked really hard, and he got the actors, and he got the um, you know uh, the chancellor of University of Ulster, and he got all kinds of great actors, and and he made this this movie, which got lots of stars. I mean, it's really evaluated as a, one of the best movies in the world. And then uh, people watch the movie, and actually they think, wow, it's well made, it's great art. Maybe the director will be very frustrated. No, I didn't want to make art, but it's too late. It's in the world, and people can decide for themselves they, they, they think it is art. So, um, of course, personal responsibility is, is very, very important. And, you know, how we generate our own courage, wisdom, and compassion is totally ours. So I totally believe in personal responsibility. But I don't believe that uh, artists and creators uh, own their creation. Maybe they, they have the right to receive the copyrights and the, the royalties, of course. But as far as really owning the meaning of the creation, I don't think so. You know, if you go and see a, an exhibition, it's your right to decide what it means to you. And if the author comes back from the grave and says, that's not what I meant, sorry, it's too late, you know. So I, th does that make sense? Ça, ça va? No? <laughs> okay, that's why I said we have to discuss more later together. But that, that's, that's for now. And then the, um, but thank you for a really great question. Uh, then the, the, other, the other question, uh, very, very important uh, and very complex actually, so I'm only going to answer a little part of it. Um, like um, you, you had, you know, experience in, in, in your work or community work that and you saw people doing things and then, oh wow, they, they assume that the other has the worst reasons. It's just automatic. So no benefit of the doubt, suspicion, fear from the start. And you, you, you've, you've seen that recently again. Uh, how do we um, overcome that? It, it's, I think it's very important. Um, so I think one way is um, what, uh, what you mentioned, Duncan, about, about an, an ethical framework, about, um, I wrote so much that I lost it, but oh yes, the spiritual aspect of the agreement, which is, we can do better. That, I think that's really fantastic because everybody knows about the political aspect of the agreement, but the ethical aspect of the agreement, if you read it carefully, it's, it's all over. And one core uh, message is that we can do better. And that's directly related to uh, what Dr. Ikeda believes in, is that each individual has this tremendous potential for creativity, for creating value, for courage, wisdom, compassion, and so many other qualities. <laughs> And, uh, but we have to make a commitment to develop it. Like you said, we have to promise ourselves and each other. We don't need a contract or an agreement outside. It has to be inside that this is the way I want to go. Um, so to stop this cycle of people assuming that the other has the worst reasons, um, I'd like to read a, a passage from the 2013 peace proposal, you know, annual since 83, this is number 30. Um, and it's, it's almost like a response to what you said. It's just like, okay, Duncan said, uh, we need um, a spiritual, what is the, we need to reinforce or we, we need to flesh out or discover the spiritual aspect of the agreement. Wow, okay. And then here are the words of Dr. Ikeda, and he wrote them before you said that, I promise. <laughs> We need a new spiritual framework that will bring, <laughs> unbelievable, <laughs> believable actually, that will bring, because that's global citizenship. I found it. Mothers make children and that's global citizenship for them. We have the same ideas, even though we are in different countries, that's global citizenship for men. So all we need now is global citizenship for human beings in general and we're done. Okay, so let me read it again. We need a new spiritual framework that will bring into greater clarity those things we cannot afford to ignore while ensuring that all that we do contributes to the larger objective of a global society or a Northern Irish society, which is the same, of peace and creative coexistence. I would like to propose that Respect for life's inherent dignity provides just such a framework. I think this is totally related because if you don't believe in life's 
inherent dignity, your own and that of others, how can you believe that you can do better? Where is it going to come from? It has to come from inside, from each of us. Um, and then he continues, if we picture a global society of peace and creative coexistence as an edifice, the ideals of human rights and human security are the key pillars that hold it up, while the foundation on which these rest is respect for the dignity of life. I thought that was very powerful because the, the human rights apparatus in the world is, is huge and it's not protecting everybody yet, but there are so many laws and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and international human rights and the, the structure around it is so huge and you have thousands of lawyers working on it and it's very important, human rights. And then human security also, a lot of infrastructure, billions of dollars. But what Dr. Ikeda says is that those two are only two branches of the tree and the trunk is respect for the, dignity, the dignity of life because if you don't have that human rights can be used in the wrong way you can you can use human rights as a, as a stick to beat on the chinese government you're not respecting them boom 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 you know but human rights are not supposed to do that they're supposed to really protect life so putting respect for life's dignity in, in the center and I, I will finish now. To ensure that respect for life's dignity is a meaningful and robust support for other endeavors. Individuals throughout the world must feel and experience it clearly and palpably as a way of life. To this end, I would like to propose the following three commitments, just, just like we said, as guidelines for action. Number one, the determination to, chair, to share the joys and sufferings of others. Number two, faith in the limitless possibilities of life. Number three, the vow to defend and celebrate diversity. So this is, this is the hardest thing to do because when we see people arguing with each other and bringing out the worst in each other because they start from the point of view that, oh, you said this or you vote for those people or you put up that flag for the worst reasons, I know you're evil. You know, when, 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 what do you do then? But it's really important to go back to self-motivation that first empower them and give them the benefit of the doubt by hearing them out. Well, wha why do you think like that? Well, because they are evil. They're all born evil. I know that. Who told you that? You know, and, and try to bring it out of them. But most importantly, the, the person looking at that, which could be you, for example, it could be any of us, we see that and we feel disempowered because, oh, wow, they... They are looking outside themselves and they don't get it and they are fighting again. Oh, gee, this is disempowering. This, this but who is watching? I, for example, it's me. I'm the one who has the responsibility to stop being discouraged watching that. And I need to bring out my courage, wisdom and compassion from scratch. Dr. Hida says often, if there's no hope, create some. <laughs> I love that from scratch just because it's going to come back. Hope is there in the universe, inside of you. doesn't matter which tradition you are in. Do you believe in hope? Yeah. Do you believe it's in people? We have an agreement. It's the second agreement <laughs> on the 10th of April. It really can come out of, of anybody anytime, but you cannot force anybody to feel hope. You can only inspire them. So it has to start inside. So I'm not, I'm, I hope I don't look, you know, I don't sound arrogant enough to, to tell you what to do. But I know that you have such tremendous potential. You can bring out your courage, your wisdom, your compassion, that even faced with people, you're trying to help them, but they really don't get it and they fight with each other. It's okay. You have the power to change even that. So uh, does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Next question. Okay, what I think I'm <laughs> going to propose is maybe a, a, sh a short uh, break, about 15 minutes. Okay, we've, uh, we're a slightly smaller group, so we'll try to be a little bit more uh, interactive. So we have the hardcore left here. Um, so let's maybe use the same process of uh, maybe three questions, and then we'll get a little bit of a, a response. Um, yeah, so, so we have one there, one there, and one over here, and then we'll come to you in the next room. So on. It's picking up the sound, but if you could speak up. Yeah, that would okay. Be um, my name is Philip. I'm from Lifering NI, which is a secular recovery group for alcoholics and drug addicts. I just want to make the point um, with all these peace studies evolving, do you not think that maybe the political party structures within themselves need to evolve 
to keep up with uh, what you guys are all doing. Um, I give a for instance of uh, the Ulster Unionist Party who about a year or so ago had a new leader. But he seems to have got rid of some of his more free thinking um, members, which doesn't really, to my head, make an awful lot of sense. Why throw out the free thinking members of your group? The ones who can really make a difference? Um, anybody, any thoughts on that type of? I'm, I'm not sure if I've got a question. I'm just firing together concepts in my head here. Yeah. Maybe somebody could sort of try to fill that in a wee bit for me. Thank you very much. Oh, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Uh, if you sit at the back there. Hi, I'm Hilary McCollum from Donegal Community Workers Co-op. The discussion's been very much about Northern Ireland, um, but living and working in Donegal sectarianism is still a very kind of live issue in Donegal and and I think really a lot of apart from the, the border counties the rest of the Republic of Ireland pretty much ignores what's happening in Northern Ireland and I think for any real progress the, the South needs to become more engaged in how they could change in order to help facilitate change here so how do you what role do you see that the Republic of Ireland playing in ongoing peace here and what's going to actually inspire and motivate them to do it okay. I'm Barbara Hart from Trinity College Dublin in Belfast um, particularly struck by the um, focus today on one set of divisions and our response to those and not much conversation at all or recognition about another division, which is gender and the lack of women's participation. The agreement benefited from the leadership of women, and as does the peace, and there were promises made in the agreement to women <coughs> that have not been fulfilled or delivered. And I think our framing of our understanding of conflict and of peace is masculine-centered and is lacking in resources. And if we would look to the leadership of women, here on the island, here at this university, we would be stronger and more capable of bringing out the best of ourselves um, to creatively respond to these sorts of issues. And it's sad to me that on the 15th anniversary that we are not hearing from the voices of women and leaders who help shape the peace, sustain the community, and who are not prominently, visibly engaged in struggling with the issues that we are facing 15 years on. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's thank on, so you, it's on. Right. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for three really, really important questions. Um, so the, the, the first one is it's about politics in Northern Ireland. Uh, the second one is about how the Republic of Ireland uh, can or cannot help Northern Ireland. Uh, so those two questions, um, I, I think I should answer because I'm completely ignorant. And I'm going to make shibboleths and the wrong, wrong words and everything. But I might give you a new idea. You never know, so let's, let's give it a try, <laughs> if that's okay. You can turn off the recorder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get fired for this. <laughs> um, <coughs> so I, I've heard the same thing from so many people, from Pauline, from taxi drivers, from all kinds of people, that there's so many good things happening on the ground that people are really trying hard for to live together, to, to develop you know, community um, a sense of community cohesion and and with the arts or you know people put up walls which is actually temporarily as a temporary measure i think it's good because going from being afraid and trying to kill each other to oh they're on the other side of the wall i can breathe a little bit it's already a progress and but then i know people who work across the walls who bring gifts from one part to the other in secret because they are not supposed to like each other. And so many, many things are happening that nobody sees. <laughs> and then there is like a disconnect with the political world where basically uh, it's, it's kind of becoming an American system when you have two major parties that have either black ideas or, or white ideas. And then if something happens in the street, are the people in power 
and, and can they really try to continue the, the vision of a uh, really vibrant Northern Ireland, or do they have to stir up trouble to get votes? In what position are they? You know, that, that's a major, major problem for politicians. So what can, can we do about this? Well, I, I really believe in uh, Harbour Mass concept of uh, deliberative democracy and also in the, the concept we call Zadankai in, in Japanese, which means to create discussion groups all over the world where people exchange ideas, which means forums or fora all over the world. So the, the way I look at it is that we would have this kind of, of discussions all the time. People would invite their friends to their house and have forums and discussions and have news, newsletters. And the politicians would have to listen because the people of Northern Ireland would be so busy in those forums generating fantastic ideas, they would have to listen. So I think that that's you know, a very positive way without pointing fingers or anything. Like, okay, we are the real politicians. We might not have the position, but we are in charge of a big chunk of Northern Ireland. First, my own body, then my family, my community. If you are teachers, all your students. If you're a businessman, all you're in charge. Each of you is a politician in charge of a big chunk of Northern Ireland. But you have to start being proud of that and confident and discussing and find ways to really get the politicians' attention. Because you can do it. There's, there's no, you can change the structure as it is now. Um, so, you know, just one idea about uh, politics. Then about how uh, the Republic of Ireland should help. <laughs> I, what do I, I have no idea, but I just want to say that the 99% of what the Republic of Ireland has to do is to listen to Northern Ireland. Listen to what they are asking, what they are saying, interview people, collect their opinion, and then if they ask, if people in Northern Ireland here ask for help, very precise way, then why not? But I, I want to share a very um, kind of a, a, a vision I have for Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm going to try to be quick. And it has something to do with Ireland, the Republic, and it has something to do with Great Britain. That, um, you know, the world is changing all the time. If you look at the map of the world 500 years ago, it was so incredibly different. So let's imagine this area in 500 years. We really have no idea how it's going to be. Maybe, may in 500 years I'm talking, right? Maybe this part of the world, Northern Ireland, will be part of the Irish Empire, with a united island that is all over the world. It's, a po it's not impossible. Another possibility is that Northern Ireland will be the most vibrant part of the UK, and it will not be reunited with Ireland. It's also totally possible. Now, we have to look at both scenarios at the same time. Okay, how can Northern Ireland win in both situations? Because since we don't know where it's going to be, we cannot design the future that we don't know. But how can Northern Ireland be a winner in any of those two scenarios? There's only one way, is that people in Northern Ireland have to create the most vibrant, the most connected, the most successful society ever. And then it doesn't matter where you're going to go. It doesn't matter. And you're going to keep your... your your Irish passport, your British passport, and both passports for the next 500 years anyway. So y you see what I mean? That um, I think that th there must be so much more energy in creating uh, a winning, on the human level, a winning Northern Ireland that can then be an asset to whatever will happen in, in the future. But focus on, on Northern Ireland is, is very, very important. And, and then if those conversations take place, then of course there will be so many things that the Republic of Ireland can do to help once the people here have decided what they want to do. So, so thank you so much for listening because I, I'm like totally parachuted from, from down here, from down under actually, because Hawaii is like over there. It's like I could have come through Japan or through New York. It's the same because it's exactly the opposite of the world. So I have no idea what's going on here, <laughs> but I just was inspired to, to, to reply like this. And uh, the question of gender, of course, is extremely important. Uh, this is kind of extraordinary. How does nature know how to create 3.5 billion people of one gender and 3.5 of the other without anybody controlling that? That is so incredible. But this is what's happening. Na nature knows that humanity needs half of each. 
So if that's the case of nature, it should be the same with economics, with politics, with people talking in conferences. But there is a, another way to um, compensate if the numbers are not there to show the parity. For example, if you have a really fantastic woman organizing a conference, and then you have three men running around to do what she says, <laughs> it kind of helps too, right, with the parody. <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing I want to say is that um, I really believe in, uh, in uh, that everything is basically a social construction. That doesn't mean it's not important. Social constructions can kill millions of people. But everything is a social construction except our humanity. So our humanity is not a social construction. That we are a human being, we are a part of life. But as soon as we think or say or do something, we, are, we participate in different constructions. And I think genders are very much constructed also. The image of the typical woman, Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> well, that's not the typical woman, <laughs> but she was a woman, you know, and the, the typical man, um, you know, can imagine all kinds of things. So I think the division between man and woman, again, is within each one of us. Uh, I, th I mean, there are many theories that prove that actually every human being is about 50-50 inside, and based on our education or training, we think we have to behave like a man, or we think you have to behave like a woman, based on which society you're on, but it's a construction. So I think if we unpack those ideas and deconstruct that, we, it's going to take a lot of time. So why don't we go straight to the ethical core of the question, what does it mean to be human? Duncan didn't say, what does it take to be a man or a woman? He said, human. It's a question for everybody. So Your turn. The, um, to start with the gender question, which I think is a really interesting question, uh, uh, or not, it's not even a question, it's a point. And, and these are really just reflections. I, I, first of all, I think being human is not a single idea. It is joint, but it's multiple in its, in its formation. So there's a kind of a sense in which part of being human is, is actually being unique. <laughs> so there's a unique, and there's a gendered, element in it which is both confining and important and it's it's uh, it's it's how we live with all that and so therefore it's something we have to pay attention to uh, especially if it is evident and a sense so both both experienced and evident that there is only a single voice in the room um, so that's First of all, you have to say that there's something going on. Some of that is historic, which is 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 to do with where we've been as a, as a whole society in the West and where uh, probably across the world, but not in different ways. But nevertheless, we have that very strong legacy about role apportionment. So there's that, and that is a big question, which is part of the same question of what does peace look like. Uh, and we have to keep talking and working and changing and acknowledging, and that's part to do with equity and attitudes, and it's all the same stuff, really. Um, positive relationships, you know, what would peace look like, and how do you move from here to there? That's fine. And there's something about ethnic ethics, which, uh, which has to do with defense and military posture, which pulls forward certain kinds of types of things into the public domain actually very and gives value to certain things and an ethic which is about you know we have we the first thing you have to do is defend your community <laughs> the second thing you have to do is uh, not give not give in and be as violent as possible in relation to the defense of that and that and that justice looks like is dependent on us winning and once that becomes embedded as a notion that's highly associated with men, it's also highly associated with a type of competition in community voice which raises people who are most like that to the front. <laughs> um, and there, I mean, we have a real crisis, in my view, which is not a good, bad crisis, but a legacy crisis, which is that to have voice in communities, you had to be violent and militant. And <laughs> one of the interesting things, uh, looking at Roshan, because we've worked for a long time in the same area, effectively, is that... Um, 
I went to a conference last year uh, of which uh, part of CRC, which we were <coughs> funders, and uh, what was really evident was that the peace process had changed the gender of the room from female to male, actually, and that's in the community relations end, that's not in the public politics end. Uh, and that was because the jobs were going to uh, pull the men who'd come in, and it was really clear. We, I had been used to being in rooms which were probably 60% female, certainly 50-50, uh, but 60 probably majority female, uh, that the community relations responsibility lay on that set, where politics was the other way around. But actually, now, it was all about interfaith work and negotiating that and the requirement and possibly the only option of uh, employment in for people uh, coming out of paramilitary-related activity going into things. And we have a really serious crisis in that whole gender discussion as well. So as you unpeel the onion <coughs> of our peace process, I suppose I would say that it's always both and. The, first of all, it is a, the fact, we, we, instead of, in a sense, fighting about it, we should say that the absence of women coming forward or being elected or choosing to come forward, whatever it is, and being given recognition in the public domain is a problem for all of us. So that just needs to be stated. It is a problem for everybody. It's a bit like, you know, there aren't enough Catholics going into the RUC and that's a problem for Catholics. No, it's actually a problem for Protestants too. It's, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. So we have to be serious. Uh, the set, and what are we going to do about it? So that's an interesting question too. The second one, I suppose, is uh, from the other side of that equation is how do we be in a world which is like this, which break, makes this manifest? So that is the other side of that equation, about which I think it's more empowering. It's the more hope type question, which is then what are the things which would allow that to become an absurd outcome, to appear as an absurd outcome to everybody? And I think uh, that's probably a piece of work we could all begin to think about and do. Um, so, uh, but as a contribution to the general progress of humanity, of course, and it is all part of the same, you know, global stuff, and it's local action which is required. So all I can say is, we need to talk, we need to think, we need to do something at all sorts of different levels. Some of which are structural, and some of which are action and person. Um, and that language, actually, of the local and the global, is interesting. I mean, that's that's kind of green language. That's language of feminism, that's the language of all of these things. It's not really any change. It's all across all of these different same things. There's a recognition that, that, that it, starts, it all ends and in all places and activity at both levels makes sense. But there is certainly something that has to be put into the structural question, which is if this is happening, something's not working. We are promoting certain types of things which are not creating it, and that's, I think, a real challenge and fair. Uh, Republic of Ireland, um, it's interesting, actually, part of there, I could give you, you know, my ten-point lecture as usual on Irish politics and British politics, but there's a sense in which Northern Ireland, as in this strange entity we live in, and I use that at the moment, is uh, was, and I think it was largely accidental, but it was stumbled upon way in which the rest of Ireland and the rest of Britain got out. That at the beginning, if you even go before 1920. Uh, the questions of British Irish relations were, were things which clearly involved politics on, on these islands. They had responsibilities for them throughout Ireland, there were responsibilities for them throughout Britain, and that was part of our history. When Northern Ireland came into existence, it had a paradoxical effect, it separated off the worst of the stuff of, of the British problem, if you like, from the southern side, our problem with the British. It separated off our problem with the Irish, in effect, for the vast majority of Britain, for Scotland, Wales, and England, no longer important, small enough and can be dealt with. So we become a kind of concentrated, well, everybody else kind of can walk away now, it's dealt with, because we're all separate and we're going in our own directions and we can slowly recover from each other. Uh, <laughs> the, conce the consequence inside the North is of a kind of a super concentrated version of history in which we're stuck with it, and we re-articulate that as Catholic versus Protestant to, to almost make a difference, to almost say. Now, it's clearly connected to it, the sectarianism in the religious line of it and in the political line of it. There is no way in which you can finally separate those things. 
but there are ways in which they can be re-understood. And there are we one of the ways of talking about that is that uh, people outside Northern Ireland therefore don't have to recognise that Catholic versus Protestant, that's something they're stuck in the kind of Reformation in, in 400 years ago and there's nothing to do with the rest of us. So it's a, it's a part of a distancing language. Now, the reconnection, uh, that is why I personally think that the fact that um, there's a couple of things here and I just want to put it on the table. The fact that reconciliation first is nameable by the British and Irish government is actually quite important and quite significant. It actually says something which people in interfaces are telling us all the time, which is we're bearing the cost, but actually expecting us to find the solutions while it's in our face is really, really hard. It actually has to be some of the people who've got room here who are less up against it, who, for whom it's slightly more distant, who have to find the space there. I have to say, my feeling is that the rest of Britain and the rest of Ireland wanted this like, and still want it, like a hole in the head. It's kind of stay away from this as far as possible. The closer you get to the border, and that the particularly three Ulster counties, I think are, and Laos to some degree, are um, too affected by it. And they were part of the turning your back on the north, so they actually found themselves, although they're certainly not Donegal, but the others are in the middle of the country, feeling like they're on the edge of the country. And Donegal completely isolated, almost like a kind of an independent <laughs> place of its own. Um, now, you, you end up with a, with a kind of a, a and, and a kind of sense that as you get up there, you're getting close to what you want to avoid. You know, this is kind of the closet. Now, the, to that <coughs> degree, I think, uh, the fact that uh, it came from there is important. That's number one. Number two, I think, it will continue to involve people there in the power centers of those places finding their responsibilities and being willing to be actually paradoxically changed by Northern Ireland. It'll, it'll work the other way around if this works, is Northern Ireland will be a possibility to begin change elsewhere. Uh, but the, the actions, and, and, and therefore we'll find our reconnectedness again. You know, we'll find the, the, the ways in which we can deal with some of these things. And I certainly think that Donegal in particular has some interesting things to say because it has had to deal with things in a different kind of a way and find different ways to deal with it. So I certainly feel for the North West, there was always very good work going on across the board in which that was a very important conversation to be had because Protestant experience was definitively different on the other side of the border uh, and uh, the experience of what sectarianism was was definitively different and had to be dealt with differently. So I think there's been a useful and important conversation there and we need to work on that. Last bit I would just say to take that on is there's another sense in which we in the North are also living with a problem, a very big problem, which is that while Britain and Ireland dealt with Northern Ireland by arm's length and keeping it as far away as possible until it became just too painful not to do that anymore and having to find your, your way forward in it. Although I have to say part of the problem now is as soon as they got a chance to go back to pushing it away, <laughs> they, they took it. And that's one of our problems at the moment is that the governments out there are kind of push, still want to push it away and I'm not sure that we can resolve it without their engagement, I have to be honest with you. Uh, but the, it is also how it was handled inside Northern Ireland paradoxically. The way to live in Northern Ireland was the security policy that was followed and it was probably kind of wise security and not getting at people was actually to try to focus it into areas where you could contain it. And so the real truth, there's a, a, a non-spoken truth in this community which is never really articulated or worked through, which is that what the troubles were is incredibly dependent on whether you were, if you like, in the war zone or whether you got out. And there are really only three groups of people who, who lived the upfront immediate emergency thing. They are the poor in Belfast, uh, largely in the interface zones where they're side by side north and west Belfast, but inner east and parts of south Belfast too, so that's where you are, the poor, but it's very definitively that. If you had money, you got out, it's quite polite, same thing. I mean, you, if you had a choice, you probably didn't keep your kids there. It's just a fact, that's how capitalism works. Uh, the second thing is uh, people in country areas who had big attachment to land and were very attached to each other, so you have these zones uh, in, the, in rural districts where there's real pain, where people have living with their neighbours who have killed each other and you know all of that kind of story, joint security forces, and but it's very intimate. Uh, around the border areas as well, 
where there was a very big interfaith. And then the security forces, who by nature of their job, actually have a story which says that they went into the middle of these stories and tell the story. Now, if you're not connected to any of those things, largely speaking, you watch this either through your own personal beliefs, if you have them, but if you didn't, wisdom was stay as far away from this as possible. So if you uh, don't live in those zones, then basically you were, you were frightened of it, and you, it certainly had, didn't have no impact on you. You kind of braced yourself for 40 years against it. So you can say, I was involved. You watched and were horrified by what was going on, but wisdom was not to, not to touch it. And so the consequence now in the way we're looking at peace is that a lot of the people who lived outside those war zones still feel that getting involved in this stuff dealing with the problems is not one, nothing to do with them since they weren't involved, and two, uh, not something you would advise your children to do uh, any more than you'd advise them to take drugs. So there are huge resources in this community voluntarily walk away from having anything to say about this community, leaving it up again to the people in the interfaces who have not got the room, <laughs> but do understand the necessity <laughs> to find the answers. And I am absolutely sure that we have to break that, that it is that all the levels have to be re-engaged in our acknowledgement that people in interfaces were largely carrying out things which we gave them permission to do. We were the permissive environment, what the Scottish, called the, the Scottish police called the permissive environment for sectarianism. We were the permissive environment within which this happened. <laughs> and you couldn't have done it without the permissive environment. <laughs> and we belong to it as part of that. So we need to reconnect that and find what our responsibilities are in that. So what I'm saying is, Republic of Ireland, yes, Britain, yes, us, uh, uh, but mo not just people living face by face and cheek by jowl, but everybody else looking at what we have to do in the middle of this. So it is a responsibility taking exercise. The last one was uh, the question of political party change. And I <coughs> am sure you are right. We can't stay in the same formations forever. That process should be something we, we witness as time goes by. What is really scary, I think, is we have ossified into somehow that it seems to have had the effect of ossification as opposed to, to gradual transformation and engagement. And I think we need to say, it, it doesn't matter in a way what the vehicle is, but what really matters is that it is no longer having the same effect of keeping us into a them and us type of framework. If that means that the Sinn Féin and the DUP internally transform and are no longer that, that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is that <coughs> different parties come onto the stage and we start to talk in different ways with each other. Now, I don't know how politics works. I think it's a bit of a market, and so it'll probably be some mixture of those things. But the, uh, the bottom line is, I think, this current situation of clinging on to power with institutions which need, in, which like all institutions, try to keep themselves alive uh, without a conversation about how that is a way in which we have an open conversation rather than a closed one is, for me, not really a, a long-term solution. And I think it'll, it'll, it'll collapse in its own problems. Because as, and if it doesn't collapse on sectarianism, which is, looks as if that's the, the horse to back, the other one might be corruption. Because what they'll find themselves doing is, like every politician, um, giving out uh, the sweeties to the people who they like and not giving them to the people they don't like. And that is like what politicians do, by the way. That's not any political, political party. And the consequence of that will be eventually people will get very, very cross. Okay, thank you. The voice Honor. of women, the voice of women is what we need to hear now. Pauline <laughs> hasn't been able to say anything. Okay, I, I'm you. just also conscious of time and people have been here a long time. So we've only got about eight minutes left. So I... I do you want us to start to I round it up? So. All the eight minutes to you see, if, if, if you're a woman, you're rationed straight away. I'm speaking as a human being, okay? <laughs> um, first of all, the question about politicians. I say something that those who know me have heard me say many, many, many times. There's a need for an awful lot of, you could say, training, or you could say staff development. I prefer to use the phrase staff development for politicians. And any of you who have sat in Stormont and listened or who have seen the, the performances on television realize that the standard, seemingly, of the debates, very, very low, very, very low. 
there seems to be a major, um, huge gap in knowledge about economics in the whole um, um, government, ministers, the whole lot. There's not very good, there aren't very good communication skills. You know, sometimes I'm looking at them, listening to them, and I think, not just talking about grammatical errors, although there are plenty of them, but the, the capacity to, to get their message across, to speak clearly. It's just horrific, actually. It's a very, very low level. And there are all sorts of other aspects connected uh, with that. There are very, very few, fewer people now voting than ever before. And that's going down. And fewer younger people voting. And a real ignorance on the part of young people about politics, about what democracy is all about. And that became evident during the protests, marches, etc. And the interviews on television again with young people wrapped in Union Jacks, etc. And the way they tried to answer the questions showed that they really have no knowledge about politics, government, governance, any of that. Now, what can be done about that? I've been preaching for the need for political with a small p education many, many times, and in my experience in, in um, the biggest girls' school in Europe, by the way, before I went to work in the university, I introduced uh, economics, politics, sociology, all of the social sciences at different levels, because that's what's important too. Very often, that kind of knowledge is accessible to what's called the top level academically, but not to where there is also a real, real need to everybody so that they'll know the importance of voting. I remember once being hugely impressed uh, when I was in South Africa. Once, <laughs> I was there a few times, but um, uh, just when the, the new constitution was coming in and the right to vote and seeing long, long, long queues of people wanting to vote for the first time because they realized that gave a potential for power. So staff development, um, the, the political structures in Stormont, I don't know. Um, I don't know whether it can survive without an opposition. It was one of the first comments I had, actually, when, uh, when that was established after the um, Good Friday Agreement. I, s I wondered, I said, how long will this last without an opposition? Not necessarily saying that I want an opposition or that it's essential, but you need some, some kind of a mechanism to show that, that things can be changed. At the moment, that doesn't seem possible, okay? Um, I remember, too, um, uh, when I was president of the Irish Association, which um, I'm very pleased that ICADA is our very first international member. I'm really proud of that. But I used to have seminars um, in Stormont with uh, panels of representatives from all of the political parties. And the first task was to get them to look at each other. <laughs> and the second task was to get them to speak without sniping at each other, to stay focused on whatever the, t the theme was or the topic or whatever. It was, uh, it was absolutely incredible. I mean, there's a need to address the standard of the, of the, the um, politicians, the ongoing staff development that they need. Um, how do you do it? You know, we could go on forever about that. Th but there's a real need, too, to have more information to people. And this came up in some of the discussions this morning. Very few people know about the Irish, or sorry, the Good Friday Agreement. The content of it, the fact that they can have an Irish passport, British passport, both. Very, very few people are aware of all of this. And, you know, we're, we're in education. We should be addressing political education, okay? We should be addressing all of these things. Um, reconciliation, that's, that's another day's work, and I'll not go into that because there, the, there just isn't time at the moment. But the commemoration um, arena that we're moving into now, that we're already in, in fact, all of the happenings, which were mainly violent happenings, you know, the Covenant, the 1916, all of that. How, what the, the effect of that is going to be in the long run, I just don't know. 
It could actually be a, a, a resurgence of interest in those um, political stroke military events. Now, if there's good um, analysis, if there are good presentations, I think the Irish Association had a very good one, by the way, um, we had about the Covenant, which I found really instructive. We had a minister from um, the, the government in the South, Dáil Éireann, speaking, and he was able to tell stories about the 1916 and afterwards that I had never heard of, you know? So there's a need for a lot more uh, opportunities for dialogue at every level uh, between the North and the South. I remember when, I'm a Southerner by the way, but I, I, I don't usually say that, I usually say I'm an island of Ireland person, which I am. But when I was coming up here after university, um, and one of the things asking, you know, one of my profes professors for a reference for something, my first job up here by the way was in a technical college, and I was the only Catholic member on the staff, and there were Protestants and Catholics, students, you know, that, but that's another big story. But his response to me <laughs> when I asked him for the reference and for where I was going, what it was for, what do you want to go up to the Black North for? Now that was a couple of decades ago, <laughs> but there was, there was the beginnings then of a lack of interest in the North. Uh, and I think that has, that has increased um, and I, I actually think there's a need to do something about that. And there are some things being done, by the way, when I was thinking of the question about the Republic. There, there are lots of contacts. In sport, for example, you have GAA, you have rugby, you have rowing, lots of contacts, some only on a province-wide basis, some of them on a, an all-Ireland basis. You have the cross-border bodies, which is something else, I think, that a lot of us don't know about. These were established by the Good Friday ag Agreement, which set up mechanisms for all sorts of, of contacts, all sorts of cooperation in tourism, in business, the Institute of Directors, North and South, you know. There are all sorts of contacts going on. But the other thing that, that uh, I sometimes wonder about is you have you've all sorts of activities going on in little uh, disconnected arenas and there's not an awful lot of contact between them and the big problem I think is the vertical contact between ordinary people people who should vote or who may vote and may don't vote and the politicians so if we're coming up with all these excellent ideas from the speakers here how do we get them up to the decision makers that's another task, I think, that needs to be addressed, and it is a real task. Otherwise, there's, there's no point in politics. I'm nearly finished, just um, one or two other things about the gender issue. Um, I totally agree with what you're saying, actually, and it's a constant battle, and this can be very depressing at times, because you think that there is some um, improvement, and you have the Equalities Commission, and you have sometimes more women into politics, and I know from some of the, the women who are in Stormed, they get a very rough time, actually, in terms of, of uh, bad manners. Um, you know, uh, um, the, the some of the people, the other politicians could actually be, be um, brought to court for the way they insult them. I don't, there is no simple answer. Th there's just somebody said something about perseverance and discipline, and that is what women need to keep on at it, keep on at it, keep on at it. But also to get more allies, including from all the people here who would say that they support gender equality. Well then, as Olivia might say, do something about it. You know, that, that, is, that is really, really important. It's not, we're all human beings as we're reminded of, so it's not something that women can solve on their own, and in some parts of the world it hasn't started even. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, I think somebody mentioned something about Donegal, and I thought to myself, Donegal and the North are actually very connected. About half the people in Belfast have houses in Donegal <laughs> as well, you know, and they go backwards and forwards all the time, so, so there's a real connection there. But I think th the major point that I want to make is the need for the, the, the lack of knowledge, information uh, amongst the ordinary population about politics and the lack of capacity 
amongst our elected politicians needs to be addressed somehow or other. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, we're slightly over time, so I need to know what you would like to do. There were three questions over there. Um, do you want me to take those or shall we wrap it up? Okay, I mean, that, I've got five questions which, based on the last thing, would take us 25 minutes. So, you know, I. Maybe let, let people who need to go go. Yeah. And we'll have a small group okay. with the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is, there were five questions there, and I think I'm going to stick with those five, uh, five questions. So we'll go, you were waiting first, so we'll go there, there, and there, and then I'll come to you two at the end. quite interesting about the, the whole philosophy of peace and also looking at the, the, the message we received in the morning from Dr. Daisaki Kira. In fact, I want to draw attention to a, an interesting passage from Charles uh, Dickens' Great Expectation, and in which he says, in the little world where children exist, there's nothing so finely perceived and finely felt as injustice. Okay? And my question, therefore, is that how how important is justice in this ingredient of peace? That's the first question. And because the reason I ask this question is if you look at the, the central tenets of Buddhism, there is always a reference to egalitarianism. Okay, so that's the link that I want you to consider. And also, in terms of the justice perspective, is that irrelevant after 15 years of Good Friday Agreement? Okay. Uh, University uh, College Cork. Um, I, just a couple of things that we would like to say. Uh, one of the things is that, that both speakers have thrown a lot out of, out of what they had to say. Um, ironically, I found myself agreeing more with what Duncan has been saying in terms of the practicalities of it. Um, just a, a couple of things. Attention, that please. Sorry. Attention, please. This is the test of the fire and voice of the whole system. <laughs> There is no need to take any action. Um, just a couple of things that what he was talking about, interfaces, etc., and the, and the conflict being associated with interfaces. I think that the conflict was associated with a lot of areas that weren't any interfaces. Much of West Belfast, for example, Attention, please. Uh, interface, Attention, please. State, uh, this is bands, an emergency. And the same with South Armagh. Please leave the building by the nearest available exit. And I think also when you talk Do about not white use flight, the lips. Or um, I think white flight was something that affected Protestant community, Protestant working class community, more so than Catholic working class communities, which meant that throughout the whole of the period of the Troubles, places like West Belfast, or Dowling, for example, you couldn't have got a house in those areas. The because test of Catholics the tried to move, move into those areas, whereas if you look at the Shankle and some of the other in interface, inter uh, sorry, intercity, um, uh, inter city Protestant working class areas, you see a depletion, particularly of the working of the middle classes. And I think that's also linked in, in many, many ways, to the problems 
that exist in, in the shankle in terms of uh, access to education, equality of opportunity and all the rest of it. In terms of the Good Friday Agreement, it seems to me that one of the difficulties when we talk about the Good Friday Agreement is that we tend to think that it means an end of conflict. And for me, that it, it seems clear to me that the Good Friday Agreement wasn't about an end of conflict, if, if such a thing is possible, but it was about conflict transformation. It was about trying to move us forward to a situation where the conflict could take place in a less destructive form, where people you know, could still have their views and all the rest of it. So, then, so if that's the case, then the notion of reconciliation is very, very difficult to achieve because we have a whole, like a Sinn Féin spokesperson uh, came out last year and started to tell thousands that Sinn Féin wanted reconciliation. And some of the unionist politicians said, well, what do you want to reconcile us to? And I think that that's the issue. There are different visions of a new society. And people are entitled to those, to those different visions. I think the question is how do we sell those visions or how do different people sell those visions to a wide enough community? Because if you think about the, the Republicans, their vision of, uh, of the United Ireland, one of the difficulties that they're going to have isn't, in my view, convincing the Unionists so much as convincing people in the 26 counties. Um, not so much about the United Ireland, but about what form it's going to take. Is it, you know, because it's going to have the National Health Service and all this type of stuff. Um, in terms of Unionists, one of the difficulties they're going to have to face is how are they going to convince enough people um, when as time goes on, they become a minority even within the six counties. I didn't even convince people, enough people to cut the same story. <coughs> and also in, the, in terms of the wider UK. As the, as the UK, we don't know what's going to happen in terms of Scottish independence or whatever it may be. We may not be talking in terms of a UK anymore, so we may be talking about totally different arrangements. And then to go back to the last point, why do we talk about ethno-religious politics anyway? Why, why is politics based on eth ethno-religious grounds rather than on class? Well, um, issues of powerless and powerful. And of course, then you have to look at the conflict that's existed in this part of the world, not in terms of 30 years, but in terms of 800 years. Because we have to go back to things like the Statutes of Kilkenny, we have to go back to the plantation, we have to go back to the, the penal laws, to go back to all of those things which instituted concepts of citizenship based on ethno religious community identity. And it was those things that led us to the situation we're in. And the reason why people vote in those terms is because that's, for hundreds of years, that's what their community identity has been, and they're trying to defend that community identity. It seems to me, coming from my own, and this is a political perspective I would put forward, that the, the way forward is to try to break that connection, break the connection between politics and ethno-religious community identity. To do that, people, to go back to what people like Dublin were saying, People need to feel secure, you need to feel free from fear. And I suppose that's for me what the Big Friday Agreement has been about doing, about building human rights, about trying to build out discrimination legislation, and about trying to institute some form of security for people from fear of attack, physical uh, violence, and other things. So can I hand over to yourselves, and then we'll come back to the last two questions. There are all such interesting questions in the answer, they can spend all day on them, don't um, I will just say a couple of things. Um, I think that a lot of these are joined up for me at a, at a slightly different level. This is where this kind of interaction between ethnic and ethic and ethical and practical to me really matters. Is you we don't control the future. The future is really open, and actually the question is therefore the bit that gets carried paradoxically, the bit that has to be robust, is the ethics, because we will always have to deal with new issues. It's the nature of life. Things come at us, and you have to deal with them. And the question is, how do you deal with them? So that question of openness. It, we have to embed a principle, which is that when these things happen, this is how we'll deal with them. And I think that's where you actually go back not to an answer. I can't give you a structural answer to that question because I don't know what the next bit's going to be. But I do know that uh, I'll have more confidence if there's something embedded in the approach and how we, we go about these things. So the commitment is to that, and then we'll see, no, when we see it, as life goes forward, we don't know. So that's actually a silly answer, but it's what I feel about it. And therefore, you have to. Uh, the really exciting part of having been in Northern Ireland for the last 15 years with the arrival of people from outside is one, that people wanted to come here, which is interesting, <coughs> and just leave. And second of all, that, that has opened us up to a whole set of questions we didn't have to ask, answer before, but the resolution of them has to be on the same principles that we're talking about here, which is that every human person counts, and how do we make that real, in a real sense, and how do we deal with all the questions that come out? The second 
question for me is um, then around justice, the justice issues. Um, and they really do matter, of course, they really matter. Um, but the harder bit of that actually is once injustice has happened, how do we get over it? What is, uh, and actually that has to have something to do with um, an ethic which is to, which I was trying to talk about in terms of the path here because I was talking about the Good Friday Agreement, but it has something to do with, first of all, uh, forgiveness has to do with recognizing that tragically the perpetrator was human. And how do we set what they did, or what I did, let's put it that way, in the face of that other imperative, which is that that doesn't go away without demeaning what happened and that can be really, really serious uh, to the other. And I'm not sure, I think that humanity has wrestled with this for thousands of years, thousands of years. And we have a number of systems for dealing with that, some of which are legal and so on, and we have to keep with those because that's all that we have sometimes. And we have our hopes and our ethical possibilities and our models of people who've done these things. And we have our wisdom game over the years about how you deal with these things in different cultures and so on. So I, my feeling is I haven't got a magic solution to that either. I simply have a sense that we have to be reminded always that we have to deal with these. And the restorative framework essentially means that we have to go back to the ethical again, even when it's hard. But it's actually when the ethical kicks in, because it's until then it's easy, actually. The hard bit of ethics actually is when people don't deserve what you're doing. So, but the justice perspective and the claims of justice are absolutely genuine and real and have to be dealt with. So I don't think that goes away. It really becomes the substance of what we have to dialogue about quite often. Um, and actually within that word diversity, quite often the difficult parts are the hard bits about the justice questions that are in that. And I think we need to be quite honest about that. This isn't a romantic thing or a sentimental thing. It is simply a thing, actually it's a thing which is Every other alternative is definitely worse. Not returning to that human position to start it actually leaves us in the position that that human thing disappears altogether and we all get lost in that. So it's something like coming back from having gone nearly there to learn it again, and we have to do it. So that's my take on that one. The third one is uh, this question, th the history of Belfast. You, a lot of what I, I mean, of what Freedom's saying, I identify with the issue in Belfast be clear, I agree with you that it was, the, the truth is that because Belfast is surrounded or was surrounded, it's changing a bit now, by Protestant farmland and Protestant villages, the Protestants ran out and Catholics ran in to where they were safe. That was the reality of what happened. You have tight Catholic areas, you have empty Protestant areas, you have, uh, but it was also class related too. The more mobile you could be, the more, it's about who was mobile. And you end up with uh, that as the consequence because very few people given choice bring up their children in the face of somebody throwing a bomb in their house. Very few people do. In fact, I can't think anybody really would if they have a choice, if they don't know how else to cope, so, or themselves. So that's that starter. And that's, that's something we have to deal with the legacy, and it wasn't equal the way that worked. The, the safety for Catholics meant actually going into places where there weren't any houses left. You had to just, it was a huge overcrowding. The only thing I would say to you is this. The Good Friday, if the Good Friday Agreement is, is, has an ethical core, which is everybody's safe no matter what, I, my own feeling is what it's actually saying is it doesn't matter, and this is the paradox of the conflict, it doesn't matter what jurisdiction you're in, you're, you, you have to deal with that. You have to do it that way. No, you have to do it that way now. Your, the claim of the jurisdiction has to be secondary now to your obligation to do it ethically. <laughs> And you can, of course, wish and hope for it to be British or it to be Irish. It looks to me as though the British bit may depend more on what people over there decide than what we ourselves decide. You know, uh, the, the Scots may effectively redefine Britishness for us in two years' time. So that's, that may just change by the nature of that, and we won't have any control over that. Uh, the, the, uh, you may wish, of course, that Ireland is one place, I think, ethically, uh, that's perfectly okay, of course, and I personally have absolutely no objection to it in the slightest. The issue for me is Ireland, in an ethical Ireland, is not a unique, on our own, ourselves alone kind of a place. 
actually. I think there's a catastrophe in the naming of Sinn Féin for me now. Ourselves alone is, is impossible. Ourselves interconnected, yes, I can live with that. But I can't live with ourselves alone. And so what does ourselves interconnected look like in that Ireland? And that is my challenge back to those who say our answer is to be Ireland, which is fine, but it has to be an ethical one in which it has the space for that. And I think that the agreement is a profound spiritual challenge to politics, therefore. A profound challenge is which matters first. Personally, I think it really represents a revolutionary idea, which is that the ethical principle of looking after each other has to take priority over the line on the map. And whoever gets responsibility for this on the line on the map has to act ethically in relation to everybody who's in it. <laughs> and that therefore means that our focus has to be on the ethics first and on the border second, whoever's responsible. For me, that's, that's it. That's it. Um, I agree with everything you said about the third question, so I'm not going to try to answer it. And I agree also with the second question. I just want to say uh, just one thing about justice uh, that I read uh, in an article published recently by Brandon. Uh, there was one paragraph about justice, very clear and very interesting, that uh, it's an abstract concept. So the, uh, the article said that for Republicans, justice means social justice and parity. That's what it means. But for unionists, justice means order and law. So then if you try to have a conversation about the world justice, you're going to have this uh, not a good idea. So um, I would propose another definition of justice, which is the triumph of human dignity. That if a Republican can say, oh, in this situation, this has been done, there's been apologies or forgiveness or compensations, whatever happened, the person can say, I can see that this is the triumph of human dignity. I'm very happy about, about this solution. And then a unionist can say the same thing about the same situation. Oh, yes, I can see this is the triumph of human dignity. Then there they can be some kind of agreement. So I think um, I, we have to go straight to the source. And for me, justice is done when human dignity has been preserved. And, you know. uh, but I'd like to develop more about the first question, which was addressed to me. So. If I can spend a little bit of time there and go back to my presentation, go back to the model of uh, Dr. Ikeda of um, inner transformation dialogue and global citizenship. Um, it, it's actually a really big movement that there's 12 million people all over the world who are doing that actively every morning, sometimes early in the morning <laughs> or every day. But now it's starting that more and more people uh, are also following this model uh, even though they are not members of the SGI. So it's really sp spreading because it's, uh, I it's really available to everybody. I mean, people in China are studying it and applying it, and they have nothing to do with the SGI, except that they like this model. So I think it, it has the potential of being a universal model that anybody can use. And so it's, it's almost like a movement. It's, it's, uh, you imagine people marching, but it's all over the world, and they are not marching, they are, they are living their life all over the world. So um, it, it ha there, there is a term for it, this movement, this huge movement. It's called the human revolution. In Japanese, ningen kakume, human revolution. Because the French Revolution was great, but after that, lots of heads were chopped off, and France didn't become really a happy country after the French Revolution. It was better than before, but not really fantastic, because it had a massive structural change, but people didn't have time to, to, to have the inner change that goes with it. And same thing with the Russian Revolution, you know, spectacular change from the Tsar to communism, but the, the people, it takes time. So people didn't have time to do that. That's why uh, Dr. Ikeda uh, insists on the need for a human revolution where um, the ethics of, of changing ourselves is, is really important. So um, I'd like to read a, a passage that addresses your question because um, there are so many options for the future, that's right, but I think there is still common ground that we can imagine that there are conditions that those of us who believe in human dignity and in connection and in ourselves connected, which is, wow, I really love the way you, you speak because it's the, the way I think. <laughs> it's very easy. Um, I think there are basic uh, ideas, principles, goals that no matter what future will be, that's still what we want. It's kind of a win-win-win situation. 
Um, so I'd like to read uh, a passage from Dr. Ikeda that I think really uh, explains um, a basic structure of the future society we want that, that's kind of fail-safe, that we don't have that, that it's, it's terrible. We need to have that no matter what the, the, really the structures are going to be. Um, where deep bonds of trust have been established, we can experience cultural differences as the fresh discovery of other ways of looking at the world. We can further enhance our sense of mutual respect. All too often, however, such differences end up being the cause for misunderstanding and conflict. Nothing is more damaging in such cases than acts that force one's own culture and values on others. So let me read the first half, which is more the, the optimistic part, which I think can inform our vision of a future society which is even better than the one we have. Where deep bonds of trust, keyword trust, have been established, we can, thank you so much, thank you. Uh, we can experience cultural differences as the fresh discovery of other ways of looking at the world. We can further enhance our sense of mutual respect, second key word. So it's about whatever we want to do, whatever philosophy we apply, it's imperative that we build a society where there is trust and mutual respect. Now, you know, improvise or find any technology you want, but if you don't have that, you don't have a society, you don't have a community, and whatever future is going to be very bleak. So going back to the main uh, model, in, in what kind of future do we want? I think uh, inner transformation basically means uh, self-esteem. Every individual is dreaming of a future where they will have tremendous self-esteem, confidence, and be able to overcome anything. So how do we encourage ourselves and each other to develop self-esteem you know, now and in the future so that the future society will be full of individuals, full of self-esteem? That's the inner transformation that has to happen. Second is uh, what kind of dialogues do we want to hold? Dialogues that really create connection. Uh, that people become aware of what happens when they are having dialogues about how, what does it mean to really listen? To give somebody your completely full undivided attention. How do you do that? It's very, very difficult. But if you don't do that, you don't really have a dialogue. You don't really show respect to the other person's dignity. So develop you know, ways of doing this. Um, and then finally, global citizenship, I think, is uh, it's about empowerment. That do if something terrible happens in the world or happens here uh, that's connected to, to world events, and, and do we feel we have something to say? Are there mechanisms where we know we can vote tomorrow? We don't have to wait for the next elections, like you know, doing nothing. We can, we can do something. We can have our voice heard and participate in, in the, the governance of the world. So. Um, you know, if, if I could create uh, a blueprint for an ideal society anywhere in the world, I, I would recommend those three. Make sure there are mechanisms and ways for people to develop tremendous self-esteem, develop the power of dialogue that really makes people feel connected, and that structures that allow people to make decisions. Then if you have tons of immigrants, or this demographic change, or East Belfast is now in trouble, or West Belfast is in trouble before, it doesn't matter. If you have that done, everything's gonna be uh, fine, because there will be mechanisms to, to cope together uh, with those difficult situations. Does that make sense? Okay, Thank so you. I said there were two more questions. Can I please ask that you ask questions and not make points? I also need to emphasize that we've arranged a lunch for you that the catering students have prepared and so they, I want to respect them because they will miss their next class if we go very late. So if we can be brief, please. Okay, really briefly then, I'm Martin, I'm Martini, I'm Taylor, I'm also a filmmaker, I'm Jean Jose Film, and this is Michelle, and these two just about to dress to some videos and hello to the Um But just something that I wanted to ask, because I, I have a quick word with both Duncan, I want to ask them again and Duncan. As I said to Duncan, you know, can we fuse the ethical and the practical? Because we're almost being polarized put against each other and, and they sh they're not, you know. And, and Duncan was saying that he thought that we needed to raise ethical consciousness. And I just wanted to ask, in terms of communities rather than necessarily the individual, how, how can that be done? <coughs> Um, um, I'm Sheila Tmaki, I'm a practicing member of the Sabakakai International and I've been practicing 
with um, a Keita Sensei for 30 years. And um, what I would like to say is that um, there's three things that a Keita Sensei has really taught me. And the three fundamental things that he's really taught me in his teachings is first, that to achieve anything in life that I have to develop a standalone spirit and not to depend on others to do what, do my will. And the second thing that he has taught me is that to manifest these great human characteristics of courage, wisdom and compassion, that compassion in and of itself is just, it's sentimental. And to manifest, to, to, for our compassion to be of any benefit, that we have to have, that we have to manifest courage to, to kind of say things that other people don't necessarily want to hear. And in saying things in the specifics of living in the north of Ireland, because I am one of those people that Duncan spoke about that was born into, um, uh, born into um, uh, one of these um, areas, that, the conflict areas, with um, um, co family conflicts in the border counties. And like any parents, my family, tr my parents tried to get all their children away from it. I was one of the fortunate ones that was got away from it. But I have a brother and sister that lost their life because of the conflict here. And um, so what a case sensei has taught me more than anything that with that compassion without courage to stand up, to stand alone and say what has to be said is sentimentality. And through I through because I um, um, practice uh, the same teachings as a case sensei and do gongyo every morning and every evening. Every morning and every evening I have the opportunity to examine who I am and to do this thing to revolutionise my humanity. And um, so on behalf of the Kaita Sensei and my fellow members, I'd really like to thank the panel for taking this great opportunity to um, introduce the Kaita Sensei's teachings to the North of Ireland. And thank you very much. Definitely keep in touch and, and probably come back uh, often because I think um, uh, the people need to be seriously uh, investing and, and committing to listening and then if there is, a, a, you know, ask for help, of course help. And I think that this, uh, this really this problem of how can we f bring back the ethical, uh, the, the foreground and fuse the ethical and the practical is a conversation that has to happen here intensely. So um, those are my last words. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple of things. I, I'm in the end, um, the ethical isn't an idea. It is a recognition of the other. It's actually, a, it's a human, it's, it's the other invades us and we are we we accept it <laughs> and we are in their lives and that interconnectedness is not just a, a intellectual activity it's a real thing it's a real thing and we're only giving words to something here at this point which i think exists in relationships in other words peace is in relationships it's there and one of the things which is critical in Denise's question about people coming from not Catholic Protestant Irish backgrounds or British backgrounds or whatever you want to call them um, into this country is their claim on us is because we meet them and see them as like us in some important sense, i.e. human beings owed something simply by virtue of being here, that we are not human unless we're human with them, they are not, and, and that's part of it. And it's the presentation of the person, and part of the difficulty of a lot of our conversation is that uh, it's dealt with in abstractions and as, as types and, the, you know, the Roma, the, you know, blah, 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 the disabled women, men, you know, it's categorizing. And sometimes that's important and interesting in quick language, and uh, other times it is not real because 
I think my approach to these things is entirely due to a persistent experience that actually I know the other is, is important to me and actually important to me in a number of sense, they bring something different and which I don't know anything about, but also because actually in how I deal with it, my humanity is defined, actually. So the, um, there's something about this question which needs to go back to reality, which is the, the way this happens is we tell our stories of how we were made human by meeting other people. We, ent we make places of welcome. We bring these realities into the world in the work that we do. If you're doing films, I suppose you tell stories through film. You know, the, the, it's the representation of, of, the, of the opposite, actually, of, uneth of the unethical or, of, or into to which brings us all back to reality. Uh, it is the uh, meeting of others. Art sometimes, I think, is a mechanism by which things can be pushed up, uh, which are otherwise being lost. So I have a very <coughs> strong sense that the answer to this question is, in the end, practical. It is. How do we tell each other stories of the humanity of other, of, of other people and what we've met? And where do we do it? And if we have big chances to broadcast it, great. If we have small chances, we have to take, we do them in the small chances. It's that which is the difference. It's in the, so it is actually, I mean, I'm going back on my own cultural language here, but I think that there, what is interesting to me is how, how much join there is here is this is understood in the Christian terms as communion. That is what it's understood as. That is what it's about, is uh, the, 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 the way in which we meet each other as human beings again <coughs> and the context in which that happens. So the, uh, that is, the, it's, 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 it's in a sense, this question of how we rehumanize life. That's what the ethical means. So we have to get off that language of philosophy and onto the discussion of, hu of story. And I think there's something about that which is very, very important, which bridges this. Thank you very much okay. for inviting me there. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'm conscious of your words at the end because, in a sense, they served as a form of uh, thank you in a very eloquent way. So thank you.